When I was just a little girl, someone ruined my life. And to this day, I've never forgotten it. Never in a million years did I think I'd bump into them as an adult and have the opportunity to get revenge. But that's exactly what I did. Before I dive into my story, allow me to introduce myself a bit. I'm Ellie, and I'm 25 years old. I live in San Fran, and even though I've had a pretty tough life, I'm pretty happy now, and I have the greatest job. I'm a project manager at a cool startup in Silicon Valley. I work hard, not just because I enjoy my job, but because I like being an independent kind of girl. A lot of my friends ask me why I don't just find a rich guy to take care of me, and that just drives me crazy. I mean, I chose to be single because I really don't trust guys. You see, my dad is a nasty piece of work, and so he left a pretty bad taste in my mouth when it came to how I felt about men. When I was just five years old, he abandoned me and my mom in LA to go live with his mistress. Even talking about it now, I feel angry. We were devastated and begged him to stay, but he left us. After that, things were horrible for me and my mom. My dad was the breadwinner and was the CEO of a company, so we'd never had to worry about a thing. But after he left, my mom struggled to find a job, and sometimes we even went to bed hungry. I remember people felt sorry for us, and one of our neighbors started leaving food parcels on our doorstep. It was very sweet of them, but humiliating too. I hated my dad for leaving us in that mess, and I hated his mistress even more for stealing him away. I vowed to never date anyone because I never wanted to end up in my mom's position. All I knew was that men hurt women, and that wasn't going to be my story. So any time guys asked me out, I turned them down. That was until something crazy happened that changed my mind on this whole guy thing. I was feeling really ill one day, and because I lived alone, I had to go out to the grocery store to get some food. When I got back, I felt like I was about to pass out. Before I even made it inside the door, I fainted on my porch. Luckily for me, one of my neighbors saw me fainting and rushed over to help me. I'd only ever seen him a few times in passing, but when I opened my eyes, he was standing over me. I felt so grateful. He told me his name was Brian, and I couldn't believe how kind he was being. He looked after me until I'd fully recovered. He made me soup and even sat by my bed and wiped my face with a cold cloth to help get rid of my fever. The more time he spent by my side, the more I started to think maybe I'd been wrong. Maybe not all men were bad news like my dad. Maybe Brian was one of the good ones. I'm not proud of this, but I might have pretended to still be sick, just so he would keep coming to see me. Even after a week, he laughed and said to me, Ellie, your fever is totally gone. Are you just using me now? I could feel my face go bright red and jokingly said, Look at me, I definitely still got a fever. I really didn't want Brian to stop visiting. Other than my mom, no one had ever been so loving towards me. There was no hiding fact that I had feelings for him. We started hanging out more. Some days I worked super late, and whenever I came home, he'd invite me over for dinner. And one night he had set up candles and romantic music, and guys, that's when we kissed for the first time. It felt so good, and I knew there was no point fooling myself. I loved him, and he loved me too. For the next few months, we were inseparable. We spent every possible moment together, and after six months of dating, he asked me to meet him for lunch one day down by the waterfront. When I arrived, I couldn't believe it. He'd arranged for us to go out on a boat for a picnic. Then, when we were out in the water, looking back at the city, he turned to me and said, Ellie. I've never met anyone like you before. I want to spend the rest of my life looking after you, my Ellie Bear. Will you marry me? Oh my god, I'm not joking. I started crying so much, I thought we were going to capsize. This was the most romantic proposal ever. Of course I said yes. I couldn't wait to spend my life with Brian. And I was already so excited to start planning our wedding. I'd always dreamt of getting married in a vineyard near Sacramento. So now all we had to do was choose a venue and of course tell our parents. Brian had met my mom and they got on so well, but I still hadn't met his parents. They were divorced and Brian only really saw his dad. His mom was always working, he said, and so they didn't hang out much. I told him it was important to me that I met them both. So he arranged it. I was pretty nervous, but Brian's dad was so lovely, just like him. I could see where he got his kindness from. Then it was time to meet his mom. 
We went to a restaurant that she chose, and when we walked in, I thought I was going to collapse. This couldn't be happening, I thought. Brian's mom was none other than Sasha, my dad's mistress from all those years ago. I felt sick, and Brian could sense something was wrong. I tried to act as normal as possible, but inside, I wanted to scream. Brian introduced us and told me his mom was the CEO of my company's rival company. Could this get any worse? I had to smile and pretend to be happy to meet her. Honestly, I felt like I was going to puke and was counting the minutes until I could run out of there. Finally, his mom said she had to get back to work and I felt like I could breathe again. But I had questions. On the way home, I asked Brian about his mom's life, and he said she divorced his dad 20 years ago when he was just 7 years old. She'd moved in with another guy, which I knew was my dad, but they'd broken up a long time ago, he said, and she had been constantly changing boyfriends till now. I turned to Brian and I said, Are you okay with that? If she was my mom, I wouldn't want her to be playing around like that. But Brian just said, I don't care. All that matters is that she's a good mom. As for her private life, she can do whatever she likes, right? I couldn't believe it. How could Brian be such a good son? His mom had abandoned him, and he was just fine with it. I would never forgive my dad and his mistress for destroying me and my mom's life. And now I decided it was time for revenge. She'd made my childhood a living hell. And now it was her turn to know what it felt like. With planning the wedding, we started to see his mom, Sasha, more often, and I used these opportunities to try and get closer to her. Then one day I started complaining about my job, even though I loved it. And Sasha said, Why don't you come work for me? There's a vacancy going, and you'd be perfect for it. I mean, you have so much experience. This was exactly what I wanted. Now I could ruin her company and then watch her life crumble. Everyone was surprised I was quitting my job to work for our rival company, but I didn't even have time to care about what they thought. On the first day at my new job, Sasha introduced me to everyone in the software design department, and that's when I met Clark, the head of the department. He was a little older than me, around 30, and he was well known in Silicon Valley for being super smart. The department was about to launch a new app that would blow people's minds, and everyone was super excited about it. Throughout my first day there, I couldn't help but notice how much attention Sasha was paying to Clark. It was kind of sickening to watch. She constantly flirted with him, and all I could think was how he was way too young for her. At lunch, she acted like a schoolgirl, saying, Clarky, I saved a seat for you. I couldn't understand why Clark would like her. She continued to flirt with him over the next few weeks. She always brought him a coffee, and she didn't do that for anyone else. Then in meetings, she always chose his ideas. It was pretty frustrating, and I even thought about telling Brian that it looked like his mom had found a new boy toy. But then one day, I was working late, and when I walked past the meeting room to go to the restroom, I heard Sasha and Clark chatting, and I couldn't stop myself from eavesdropping. Sasha was giggling and said, Oh, come on, Clark. I'll even give you a pay rise again. It's just one date. Then Clark said, Sorry, I really can't. I'm too busy, and to be honest, I didn't have that kind of feeling for you. I'm so sorry. Ha! It made me so pleased to hear Clark rejecting her. She didn't deserve a nice guy like Clark. As I walked back to my desk, I glanced into the meeting room and I saw how upset she looked. Wow, she looked really hurt. She must have liked Clark a lot. And so, that's when my plan started to unfold. I would do to her what she'd done to my mom. I would steal the guy she loved right from under her nose. Hey guys, it's me again, Ellie. So in the first part of my story, I told you about how my dad abandoned me and my mom when I was just a kid to go live with his mistress, and that made me never want to date guys. But then I met Brian, and we got engaged! Meeting his mom was a huge shock because she was none other than my dad's mistress from all those years ago. I couldn't handle it and decided to get revenge. First, I started working in her company, and then I noticed she had a crush on Clark, the head of the software design department, so I decided to steal him from her, and you won't believe what happened next. One Friday evening, after everyone had left, I noticed that Clark was still working. I made him a cup of coffee and asked about how the proposal he was working on was going. We had a pretty nice chat, and I tried to flirt with him. I won't lie, I started to see why Sasha fancied him. He was a really nice guy. 
I even gave him my number and said if he ever needed any help with the proposal, just to call me. We didn't get to chat for long, though, because Brian suddenly called me and said he was waiting outside. When I got downstairs, he was dressed up in a nice shirt and said he wanted to take me to our favorite restaurant. I was pretty surprised because we hadn't gone on a spontaneous date in a while. We'd both been so busy recently. I ordered my favorite ramen soup, and then I smiled and asked Brian in a teasing way, What's the occasion? You haven't taken me out on a date in ages. I waited for him to reply, and he wouldn't look at me. I started to panic and asked him, Brian, what is it? Is something wrong? Then he told me that he'd just been assigned to manage a big project in New York. He said he needed to fly there the following week, and that the project was expected to last three months. But he said he'd come back every weekend to see me, and that it was just temporary. I couldn't even respond. I just stared at him with the noodle hanging out of my mouth. My heart was doing somersaults. Brian started laughing and said, Look at you, Ellie. Your mouth is open so wide you're basically drooling. Come on, I'll be back every weekend. Poor Brian. He didn't even know what I was thinking right now. This coincidence was such a perfect ingredient for my revenge recipe. Because now I could carry out my revenge on his mom without him knowing. Brian had no idea what I was up to. And I felt kind of bad. He really loved me, and I didn't want to hurt him by doing this to his mom, but I had to. I had to get revenge. Nothing else mattered. Later that night, we were watching a movie together in bed, and as the movie ended, Brian said he was exhausted and wanted to go to sleep. But my phone beeped right at that moment. It was a text from Clark. I didn't want Brian to see, so I took my phone to the bathroom to reply to him, and it said, Thanks for your support tonight. Due to that, I had came up with a possible solution for the proposal. For the rest of the night, while Brian slept sweetly next to me, Clark and I texted back and forth all night. So far, it looked like my plan was working. Then, the next week, Brian left for his business trip, and as expected, he was so busy he couldn't make it back every weekend to see me. I missed him so much, but I was also grateful because it gave me time to really get to know Clark. And during those three months, we became quite close. Of course, during that time, Sasha still consistently flirted with Clark. It was super awkward because he clearly wasn't interested. One weekend, we had a team bonding trip and went stand-up paddleboarding. Sasha pretended she couldn't do it and kept asking Clark to help her, but he pretty much ignored her and hung out with our other colleagues instead. And then she asked him to join her for lunch one day, but he said he was busy and I just had to laugh because actually he was having lunch with me. I had to be really careful that she didn't discover I was flirting with Clark, because then I could lose my job and my plan would have failed. Also, not to mention the fact that I was engaged to her son, and if any mom saw her daughter-in-law to be flirting with some other guy, she'd freak out. Honestly, it was nerve-wracking. I was constantly on edge, terrifying that she'd notice what I was up to. And there were a couple of times where she almost caught me. One night, both Clark and I worked late, and we left the office together and planned to go for a drink. But as soon as we got in Clark's car, I saw Sasha pulling into the car park. She spotted Clark and his car. She literally drove her car toward us. Her face was so cheerful that I knew she would walk toward Clark's car when she got out of her car. At that moment, I knew I had to get out of Clark's car ASAP before she noticed me. I excused Clark that I'd left my phone upstairs, and before Clark could have any responses, I got out of his car and ran as fast as I could. Just only when I safely hid behind a big pillar did I stop to breathe and realize that my heart almost exploded from fear. From that time, I was more careful with Sasha, but it was so hard. A day when I was making a move to Clark in his office, I sat close to him and gave him an affectionate look. And someone knocked on the door, I abruptly got off Clark because I thought that was Brian's mom again. I breathed a sigh of relief when realizing it was only Clark's secretary, yet my heart was still beating very rapidly. It was all worth it, though. After two months of flirting with him, he confessed to me that he liked me. When I read the text from him, I was so happy I actually squealed. I'd done it. Now for part two of my plan. I was going to use Clark to find out exactly how I could make Sasha's company collapse into a million little pieces. So, when Clark asked me to be his girlfriend, I agreed, but on one condition, that we kept it a secret. Clark agreed to this because he knew there would be lots of troubles if Sasha found out. And honestly, Clark treated me so nicely, even nicer than Brian did. He showered me in gifts and he really listened to me. 
Anytime I told him I liked something, he remembered and would surprise me with it the next time I saw him. At work, we had to keep things on the down low, but every morning I'd find a handwritten love note in the drawer of my desk. It really made me feel guilty because it was clear Clark liked me a lot, and there I was, just using him for revenge. The company was about to release the new app they'd been working on for the past year, and it was expected to make the company gain a huge market share and beat all its competitors, including my old company. So I started doing overtime with Clark so that I could get access to the info on how the software for this app had been created. It was top secret info, and as a junior project manager, I had no right to this info. My old company would love to get their hands on this confidential info, and with it, they could easily kick Sasha's company to the curb and dominate the market. Then she'd have lost not just her crush, but also her career. Served her right for what she did to me and my family. One night, after we'd worked super late, he turned to me and said, We should get going. I'm exhausted. He went to the toilet before we left and asked me to sort out the documents. As soon as he left the room, I took photos of the app development plan and all the different steps in creating the software. This was like gold, but Clark was too quick. He came back before I'd managed to take a pic of the last document. Dang. Now I just need to find another opportunity to get that last bit of info. But I had to act quickly because the app was about to be released and my old company was urging me to send the documents ASAP. That night, I felt so anxious that I couldn't sleep. What was I playing at? I mean, sure, I wanted to get revenge on Sasha. She deserved it. But this would crush Brian, who I really did love. And then what about Clark? He liked me so much and had no clue that I was just using him. He'd be devastated if he found out. How had I gone from being an independent single girl with no interest in guys to the kind of girl who two-timed? I couldn't stop thinking about it all but I had to focus. The revenge plan needed to go ahead. The next morning, I woke up feeling exhausted, but luckily it was the weekend. I'd arranged to go over to Clark's place to try and get my hands on that last document, but unfortunately, Clark wasn't interested in talking about work. He said it was the weekend and he just wanted to relax with me. Then he suggested we rent bikes and cycle over the Golden Gate Bridge and have a picnic to watch the sunset. Wow, it ended up being the best day ever. I felt so happy and I hadn't realized how funny Clark could be. We laughed nonstop and I didn't want the day to end. We kissed under the sunset, how romantic it was, but little did I know what was waiting for me at home. Hey guys, Ellie here, again. I'm going to share with you the final part of my story, and trust me, you won't want to miss it. In part two of my story, my revenge plan really got underway. Brian went to New York to work for three months, and I managed to seduce Clark. Now we're dating, and I almost have all the info I need to make Sasha's company crash. But after an amazing day out with Clark, I came home, and you will not believe what was waiting for me. Brian was there. He was sitting in my living room and he looked so angry. He'd flown home that afternoon and couldn't wait to spend that weekend with me. But when he arrived at my house to surprise me, I wasn't there. He was about to call me to ask where I was when he received a photo from his friend. It was of me and Clark. Turns out his friend had seen us sharing a picnic by the Golden Gate Bridge and had sneakily taken a photo of us kissing each other and sent it to Brian. And he was mad. He started shouting at me, saying, How could you cheat on me like this? He looked heartbroken and all I could do was cry. I couldn't even explain myself because the truth was much worse. If he knew it was just to hurt his mom, he'd never forgive me. In the end, he stormed out, leaving me there crying. But I had to be strong. I had to focus on my revenge. I didn't have time to sit and cry over Brian. For now, I'd have to put him to the side and try not to think about him. When Monday rolled around, I was exhausted. I'd barely slept the whole weekend and couldn't bear going to work. But I had no choice. The day dragged by, and by the time 5 p.m. rolled around, I waited until everyone left, and then I went to Clark's office. I gave him a hug, and he started massaging my neck, and said, Baby, you look so tired. What's up? I replied, saying, No, I'm good. In fact, I'm much better now that I've seen you. Although, I would say no to a cup of coffee. 
Of course, Clark happily went and made me one. And as soon as he was out of the room, I ran to his desk and started rummaging around looking for the documents. But I couldn't find them anywhere. Had he put them in a drawer? I quickly checked, but while I was doing that, Clark walked back into the room. Ellie, what are you doing? I got the fright of my life and stood up saying, um, nothing, just helping you tidy up your desk. It's such a mess. At that moment, my phone suddenly beeped. I went to grab it, but Clark got to it first. Oh no. Suddenly his face changed as he read my text. Then he said, what's going on, Ellie? You better explain yourself quick. He handed me my phone back and I couldn't believe it. It was my old colleague, Amy, asking if I'd got the last document yet to show how the app was put together. I felt so sick and I knew I couldn't lie anymore. I looked back up at Clark, and in tears I told him everything. Clark, I know you're probably going to hate me after I tell you this, and I don't blame you, but please just hear me out. Sasha is a nasty woman. She was actually my dad's mistress when I was a kid, and she tore apart my family. I'm so sorry, Clark, but I'm actually engaged to Brian, Sasha's son. I only took this job because I wanted to find a chance to ruin her business and life, as soon as I saw Sasha was interested in you, I decided to try and get you to like me, so that I can let her know what it's like when she loses someone she loves. Then, by using you, I'd take all the confidential info to... to... Ugh! I'm so sorry, Clark! By the time I'd finished telling him, I was crying so much I could barely breathe, and I knew Clark would be deeply upset. But instead, something crazy happened. He came over and hugged me. He told me to calm down, and then he said, Revenge is pointless, Ellie. It doesn't do anyone any good, especially not you. I know Sasha hurt you, but you need to let that go. It's in the past now. Sure, it might make you feel good right now, but in the long run, will you be any happier? I just cried even more then. Why was he still being so nice to me? I didn't deserve this. I kept apologizing, and he said he understood why I'd done it all, and that he forgave me. He said, I know you have a good heart in there. You just got a little lost. That's all. But promise me one thing. Please don't hand over the documents to your old company. Our company has worked so hard on this. Please don't do it, Ellie. Well, it was the least I could do after everything I'd done to him so far. I promised not to hand the documents over, and after I left Clark in the office, I realized something. I actually liked him. Not just as a friend or colleague, but as something more. I had actual feelings for him. And now I'd gone and hurt him so much, I felt awful. And there were still a couple of other things I had to deal with, too. As soon as I got home, I called Brian. But he didn't answer. I knew I couldn't wait any longer, so I left him a voice message explaining everything. I ended the message by saying, Sorry but I knew Brian would struggle to forgive me, and I didn't blame him. Not only had I cheated on him, I'd even tried to harm his mom. Anyway, she was his mom, even if she'd done bad stuff in her past. The next morning, I quit my job. People were shocked, but I just told them I wanted to go home and be with my mom. When I was packing my stuff at my office, I found a note paper from Clark saying, Leave the grief behind and live happily, my darling. A good girl like you deserves happiness. So Clark wasn't angry with me at all. That's enough. Now I could leave without any worries. Over the next few days, I packed up all my stuff and left San Fran. My heart was aching the whole time, but I knew I needed to get out of there and clear my head. I just checked in at the airport when Brian called me. I was so nervous to answer his call, as I hadn't heard back from him since I left the voice message. I held my breath as I accepted the call and prepared for him to shout at me. But it didn't happen. Still, with his usual sweetness and calm, he told me he was so shocked by my message he hadn't known what to say to me. It had taken him a few days to think everything through, and now he said he was ready to talk. I'm not mad at you, Ellie, he said, but you should have shared your childhood stuff with me earlier. And why didn't you tell me that it was my mom your dad ran off with? We could have worked through this. I'm so sorry my mom was the one that tore your family apart but she's different now. Please just give her a chance. Brian, I'm sorry for everything. I'm glad that you're not angry with me, but to forgive your mom, I think I need more time. It seemed that Brian was about to say something, but 
That's when I heard the airport announcement asking passengers in my flight to proceed to the boarding gate. Therefore, I had no choice but to hang up the phone. Um, Brian, listen. I'm so sorry, but my plane is ready for boarding. Can I call you back soon? Huh? Where are you going? He asked. I told him I was going to stay with my mom for a bit. Well, I reckon that it'll be better for you now. Take your time and think things through, especially our relationship. I was startled as he said, our relationship, but realized he was right. I definitely needed some time to work things out. Could I ever forgive Sasha? I loved Brian, but was that love big enough to leave all this behind? I mean, I didn't know whether I could see Sasha as my mother-in-law or not. And how would my mom react to this? I got on the plane and sat down. For the first time in months, my heart felt more peaceful again, and I felt like I could really sleep. It's right. Neither Brian nor Clark hated me. Things would be okay. I was just about to close my eyes when I heard someone say my name. I looked up, and to my complete shock, Clark was walking down the aisle of the plane. He sat in the seat right opposite me and turned to me with the biggest grin and said, I've never been to L.A. before. Want to be my tour guide? Oh my god, I couldn't believe this. What was he doing here? I was so shocked to see him, but at the same time, there was no denying the excitement I felt. No one could ever say I led a boring life, that's for sure. I gave Clark a smile and said, sure, to him. I have no idea what the future holds for me, but I guess I'll find out soon. Wish me luck. Here I was, standing in the middle of Christian's apartment with a dumbfounded look on my face. I know I dated a lot of guys, but could it really have been so many that I'd accidentally dated this guy twice? I took another look around the room. Oh my god, that hideous lamp and minuscule kitchen looked really familiar. I was feeling uneasy as I sat on the couch and stared at the guitar. Okay, now I was sure that I'd definitely been here before. Panicking, I made an excuse that my favorite TV show was about to start, so I had to go home. Then I ran out of there. From that moment on, I avoided Christian at all costs. He tried to call and message me a bunch of times, but I ignored them all. How was it possible that I couldn't remember dating him? I mean, okay, I suppose I had been on a bit of a dating streak recently, but it was hardly enough to date myself into oblivion, right? Besides, if this was the case, shouldn't he be able to recognize me too? On the day we met, I was in a terrible mood, so was drowning my sorrows in a bar. I had a bit too much to drink, so when I walked out and accidentally bumped into Christian, I began blaming him. But instead of ignoring a drunk girl, he made sure I got home safely. After that, I don't know if it was by accident, fate, or if Christian was stalking me, but I seemed to run into him all the time. Hey. If the universe wanted us to hang out, then who was I to stop it? So I started talking to him and turns out we got on really well. Then, of course, came that day when he dropped the bombshell. He said he likes me, and I kind of like him too, so we started dating. Now, did you see how wrong this was? If I'm his ex, then why did he approach me? Also, I mean, what are the odds for the both of us to just have zero recollection of each other? Or... Was he pretending not to know me? If so, then what were his purposes? Ugh, the best thing to do is to dump him first, right? Problem solved. But then one day, I got home from college to find Christian standing at my door with a bunch of groceries. He came by to cook me dinner. Oh, that's kinda sweet. Well, seeing as he's here, I should hold off on breaking up with him until after dinner, right? But man, it was so hard. All I could think about was how caring and thoughtful he was. Then suddenly, he said something that messed up my whole plan. My roommates are terrible cooks, especially my brother, so the two of them pester me to make all of their meals. Wait a minute, did he just say brother and roommate? So it turns out, he wasn't living alone. What a relief! That means there was still hope that I could have dated his brother or his roommate, not him. I just needed to figure out which one it was. I needed to find out more about them, so I praised him for more information. 
He told me that his brother was dumped by his ex in the worst way possible. He'd arranged a romantic dinner at a restaurant, and while he was talking, she screamed out that she wanted to break up. It was not only devastating for him, but also humiliating. Oh. My. God. That sounded so familiar. Because I often did that too. It's like my signature move. Could it be that the person I dated was his brother, Connor? If yes, then that would be great. It means I could continue dating Christian, right? To be honest, I really hope it's Connor. So all I needed to do was meet the guy and let him confirm it. But easier said than done. The guy was never home. Until one night. Christian and I were at a bar when we heard some loud noises coming from the booth next to us. A guy was yelling at a couple. Seeing that, Christian immediately ran over to them and stopped the guy. Turns out the guy yelling was Connor, and the couple were his ex and her new boyfriend. So she was the one who broke up with him in that terrible way. Not me? Now it's either Christian or his roommate. While I was in deep thought, Christian came back with two hot dogs in his hands. Hey, Christian! Suddenly, we heard someone calling his name. We turned around to see two guys standing behind us. It was none other than Christian's roommate, Wes, and his... Boyfriend! Yes, you heard me right, his boyfriend! So that means I didn't date him either? After that, I couldn't pay attention to the game anymore. In what way could this all make sense? But wait, maybe I was wrong. I mean, many apartments look the same, don't they? Seeing me zoning out, Christian nudged my arm, then handed me a hot dog. I thanked him and was about to take it when he snatched it back. Oh wait, you hate ketchup, because you always get ketchup stains on your clothes. Here, take this one. What did you just say? How did you know that? Oh, you did tell me once, don't you remember? I just gave an awkward smile. I'm 100% sure I hadn't told him that. So, there's no denying, Christian is my ex-boyfriend. It's settled. I'm breaking up with him. That night, I couldn't sleep, as all I could think about was Christian. He obviously remembered me because he knew about the ketchup thing. But why the act? Oh my, he definitely wants revenge. I'm sure of it. But, ugh, why did this suck so much? He was just some guy. I could find another boyfriend easy enough, right? But chances are, they wouldn't be as sweet and caring as Christian was. <sighs> One time when I was stressing out about my essay, he stayed up late so he could read it through for me and point out any typos. And whenever I was feeling down, he would send me a cake. Sometimes a box of donuts with a little note to cheer me up. I was definitely going to miss his cute ways, but I couldn't do this anymore. He had to go. So the next day, when I met Christian for lunch, I decided to take the opportunity to break up with him. But before I could say anything, we ran into a guy who claimed to know me. Oh my god, is that you, Sadie? Huh? Who is he? Oliver? My god, long time no see. You know Sadie? Christian? Hey, what a small world. Yeah, um, we used to date. My god. Guys, Guys, this is Oliver, who happened to be Christian's former roommate, which, apparently, my ex. He used to live with Christian before Wes moved in. So that means, hooray! Christian wasn't my ex and wasn't longing for revenge. Yay! Although, it's kind of weird that Oliver didn't look at all familiar to me. Hmm, maybe I really did need to stop dating so much. This is crazy, but it made me realize something. I really had fallen for Christian. So I decided to set up a romantic dinner in a nice restaurant so I could tell him. Christian, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I love you. I eagerly awaited for him to say it back, but no. Instead, he burst out laughing. Huh? And that's when everything came to light. Guess what? Christian really is my ex. When we were at the basketball match, I made a big mistake with the ketchup thing. I sensed you were sus, so I asked Oliver to pretend to be your ex. And it worked. <laughs> but, but why? What did I do to you to deserve that? Oh wow, you really don't remember, huh? Well, just proves what a terrible person you are. 
You don't care what love is. You just like to mess with people's feelings, then move on to your next victim. Well, let me refresh your memory. We used to be a happy couple. Until one day you decided to end things without even an explanation. Right when I was having the hardest time. Things didn't go well at work and my mom was sick in the hospital. Did you know how heartbroken it made me feel? I... Then a month ago, when I saw you dump that guy in public, then walk past me without even recognizing me, I knew everything was a joke to you. So I came up with this plan, and I don't regret anything. Then he stood up and walked off. What? That couldn't be true, right? Because I had no recollection of what Kristen just said. But he seemed adamant it was true, so I went to see my doctor. Actually, ever since the accident... I haven't been back here for any extra checkup. And you know what? After several tests, I was diagnosed with memory loss. Well, that explained a lot. You see, a few months ago, I had a bicycle accident. I fell off a cliff, but luckily it wasn't high. I bumped my head, but I thought I was okay, as I still remembered my family and friends. Turns out, I only lost the memory about the period of time when I was dating Christian. How ironic. <sighs> but it was a big misunderstanding. You know, I have this bad habit that every time I feel someone's getting distant towards me, I save face by dumping them first. So maybe when Christian was busy taking care of his mom in the hospital, I misread the situation and ended things with him. Ugh, he was right. I am a horrible person. I can't believe I let an amazing guy like him go. But nope, not this time. I believe the universe gave me a second chance. That's why I met him again. So I ran to Christian's apartment to explain everything to him. But when I knocked on the door, Wes opened it. You just missed him. He's heading to the airport to visit his parents for a few weeks. What? I couldn't wait two more weeks. So I took a cab to the airport. But on the way, I got stuck in traffic. Ugh, how am I supposed to find him now? Wait a minute. I've seen this scene play out many times in movies. So, can you guess what I did next? Yep, I stepped out of the taxi and ran like a crazy person up the road. I looked into each taxi, hoping to find Christian, and... Do you believe it? I finally found him. He looked very shocked when he saw me getting into his cab. Before you kick me out, please let me explain. Then I began to tell him about my mom and how my dad and countless other men abandoned her. I was left terrified of being abandoned by someone I love, so my own irrational fear meant that when Christian was busy taking care of his sick mom, I thought it was a sign that he was about to dump me. So I ended things first with him. It's not because you didn't mean anything to me. On the contrary, you made me feel safe. I just like you so much that I didn't want to get hurt by you. Then I explained to him about my accident and why I don't remember him. Christian remained silent and kept his head down. It seemed like he didn't want to give me another chance. I tried, but I couldn't make him forgive me. So, feeling glum, I opened the car door to get out. But Christian took my hand and said, Sadie, I have missed you. Okay, fine. Let's give it another try. So that was it! Christian gave me a second, oh wait, actually, it's the third chance. <laughs> and can you guess what we did next? Well, I'm now sitting at the airport with Christian, waiting for our flight to his hometown to meet his parents. I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. Wish me luck! I stand here before you, looking back fondly on the four years of legacy we've all made together. Do you see her? The girl in the graduation gown giving that awesome speech? Well, that was me, Taylor Flores. Take a look at my parents. They looked so proud of me. Oh, but I will never forget this face. This is Jonas, my arch enemy. We were the top two students in our school and had been competing against each other since forever. But too bad, Jonas, you lost the final battle because I was the one asked to give the graduation speech, not you. It's safe to say that I had it all figured out after high school. First, I would move to New York to attend the most prestigious college in the city, majoring in English, of course. 
Then, when I graduated from college, I'd write my first novel, then publish it to acclamation and glory. Now, that's what I call a perfect plan. <laughs> Just wait for it. You will see my face on thousands of book covers. Taylor Flores' time has come. I want those pages by the end of Friday, else be prepared for a pay cut this month. Ugh! I hate deadlines! As you can see, my life didn't exactly turn out as I planned. What went wrong, you ask? Well, after I graduated from college, I pursued my writing dream. But every agent and publisher I sent my novel to rejected it. I kept pushing myself to write more, but then I ended up having writer's block. I couldn't create stories anymore, so I decided to switch to writing for newspapers. I used to think that if I had to write for a newspaper, then it'd at least be a famous one. But life is not a fairy tale. On the contrary, it's actually cruel and unfair. Well, at least it was to me, because my preferred newspaper rejected me a bunch of times. So now I ended up here, working for this unknown news website with an all-time grumpy manager. <sighs> Okay, so back to what was happening at the office. Suddenly, my phone buzzed through an email. Oh no, it's an invitation to my high school reunion. No way I could go back to my hometown and see everyone. They'd all see what a loser I'd become and I'd be the joke of the party. All the worst case scenarios were running through my mind until a call from Amelia came. It's my bestie from high school. She asked me if I was going and I told her never in a million years. If you don't go, then everybody will assume that you failed in life and you're too ashamed to go. So the best thing you can do is to attend and keep your head up high. Man, Amelia really had a point and was great at persuading other people. No wonder she's now a lawyer. Ugh. So here I was, in front of the venue, feeling so nervous that I thought I may throw up. But it's now or never, right? I just needed to put my game face on. I entered the room to a load of unfamiliar faces. Huh? Was I in the wrong place? I was about to leave when I suddenly bumped into somebody and fell on the floor. Ouch. I looked up. It was a chubby lady who was holding her baby in one arm and gripping a toddler's hand with the other. I instantly apologized. I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't hurt the kids. Oh, it's fine. You're lucky my belly was big enough to block you. <laughs> she then paused and took a closer look at me. Is that you, Taylor? You look great. Let's get inside. The party just started. Wait, she knew me. But who was she? I guess she did look familiar. Maybe I should wait for Amelia and ask her, as she had kept in touch with most of our classmates. I looked around, trying to find someone familiar to have a chat with, but my gosh... Why was it so hard? But then I saw a woman who had beautiful, long, blonde hair, and I instantly knew who it was. Jessica, the hottest and most popular girl in high school, and the captain of the cheerleader team. I walked over to her, and we began to catch up. We chatted a lot, and she was so funny. Hmm, I don't remember her being so hilarious. My god, you're so funny, Jess. Hey, Jessica! I heard Amelia shout. I looked over at her, and she was walking towards someone else. It was the chubby lady from earlier. So, she's Jessica? Oh my, she definitely changed a lot. But if that was Jessica, then who was this? Thank God I didn't say her name earlier. I excused myself from this mystery person, then whispered to Amelia, asking who the lady was I was talking to. Beats me. Why don't we ask her directly? She then did exactly just that. The lady gave us a playful smile, saying, Try guessing. Are you Ashley? Nope. Natasha? Wrong. Tiffany? Negative. Wait, are you related to Jack Miller? You kind of look like him. Almost correct. Oh my, she wasn't related to Jack Miller, because she is Jack Miller. Well... Now she's Jill Miller. Turns out she never felt comfortable being a boy, so after high school, she underwent transgender surgery. Wow, that's incredible. I kind of felt overwhelmed, so I went to the bathroom to freshen up. On my way out, 
I saw a familiar face. It was Luke, the most handsome guy in high school. He was picking up trash and putting it in the garbage can. Aw, what a nice guy. We talked for a bit and... Oh, turns out he works here as the janitor. He was the one who recommended organizing the reunion here, and he was cleaning up as much as possible so later it wouldn't take him so much time. For real? Who would have expected that? I went back to the party and saw Amelia talking to a guy. Oh, who is this handsome dude? Amelia beckoned me over and introduced him to me. I couldn't believe my ears. It was Jonas, my arch enemy. The chubby dwarf Jonas with a face full of pimples now resembled an Abercrombie and Fitch model. Jonas just told me that he's been promoted to a higher position in his company. Ugh, seemed like he still kept his bragging habit. Some things never changed. Suddenly, Jonas asked me, What about you, Taylor? How has it been going for you lately? Oh, snap! I couldn't tell him that I was working for this awful news website. That would be so humiliating. So, thinking fast, I blurted out that I was a managing editor for this huge newspaper in New York. Jonas and Amelia looked at me in shock. In your face, Jonas. If I had a mic... I would definitely drop it. <laughs> I asked Jonas what position he was promoted to, and he replied, Oh, I, um, got chief technical officer. Ha, huh, nice try, but it was no match for my amazing <laughs> job. I won that battle, loser. Well, in general, the reunion went pretty well, even though I had to lie about myself. But whatever, it's not like I was going to see Jonas again, right? Wrong. A week later, I received a Facebook friend request from him. First, I ignored it, but then a few days later, he texted me via messenger, asking why I didn't accept him on Facebook. Ugh, that was so annoying. Fine, but first I had to readjust my page. I needed to hide photos, statuses, and tags that were related to my company. Done! Then Jonas began to text me. It was nice seeing you the other day. Would you like dinner sometime? Um, I'm sorry, what? Was he asking me out on a date? Or was this a prank? Because I live in New York. I told him that, and oh my god, he lives in New York too. Ugh, great. But the thing is, I told him last time that I'm an editing manager, and that's a busy job. So during our date, I asked Amelia to pretend to be my secretary and call me a bunch of times during dinner. However, before we could play our act, Jonas was the one who received a dozen calls and then had to leave early because of an incident at his company. After that, he texted me quite a lot, but still feeling bitter from being ditched at dinner the other day, I only replied to him after 30 minutes. Every time. But on days when he didn't text me, I found myself staring at my phone, longing to hear from him. Jesus, I was falling for him? Jonas? Why Jonas? I couldn't understand myself anymore and was unable to stop my feelings. So when he told me he liked me, I said I liked him too. And soon we became a couple. It was great at first, but then Jonas insisted that he drive me to work and pick me up. Oh no. I refused, of course, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. Ugh. So when Jonas dropped me at the fake office, I had to run. No. I had to sprint five blocks to my real office to make it on time. And then in the evening, I had to leave 30 minutes earlier to run back to the other office and wait for him to pick me up. The first three times, I could handle it. But Jonas wanted to drive me to work every day. That's enough. I needed a break from all this running. Eventually, I came up with an excuse. I bought a bike and told him that I wanted to ride to work, as it would be good for my health. Phew. I didn't have time to run five blocks each day anymore because I had an important interview to prepare for. Oh yeah, I was applying to my dream newspaper. Again, if I did get in, I don't need to lie to Jonas anymore. And luckily, my interview went pretty well. I had a smile on my face as I walked over to the elevator. First it was just me, and then a bunch of employees went in. The elevator was about to close when suddenly, from the outside... Someone put his hand between the doors. Please wait! 
And that's when I saw a familiar face. Jonas! Our eyes met, and we both looked shocked. Then one of the employees said to him, Hey boss, I already finished the report, and will send it to you this evening. What? Why did the guy say that to him? When the elevator reached the ground floor, I quickly ran out of it. Jonas ran after me, held my hand, and said, Wait, let me explain. What is there to explain? We both lied to each other. Jonas held me in his arms and tried to keep me calm. Then he began telling me everything. Oh my god. Turns out he's the actual editing manager of this newspaper. Ugh! Well, that explains a lot. I should have known he didn't work in technology, as I once asked him to repair my laptop, and he ended up locking himself out of it. Hearing you say you had my job shocked me. I didn't want to embarrass you, so I made up another position. So he knew right from the beginning I was lying! Then why did you insist on driving me to work, when you already knew I didn't work there? <laughs> I was just messing with you. Besides, I was kind of curious to see how long you could keep the lie up for. I'm sorry. But the truth is, I like you. I have liked you since high school. Back then I was always competing with you because I wanted you to notice me. I thought I was about to throw a tantrum, but thinking back, it was all my fault. If I hadn't lied in the first place, then Jonas wouldn't have had to lie about himself. Right at that moment, I received an email from Human Resources. Oh god, I got in! They were so impressed by me that they had to email me right away. I was so happy that I hugged Jonas as he said, Congratulations, newbie. Now, let's get to work. Your first task is to go out on dinner with me. Yeah, so now Jonas and I work at the same place, and he's my boss. I used to hate losing to him, but now that he's my boyfriend, I feel fine. Actually, I'm really proud of him. <laughs>
Fine, act like a moron and stay in this moronic place forever. I'll get our old house back alone. After a busy shift, I just wanted to get home and go straight to bed. Only when walking along the curb, I spotted Cedric doing some dumb, noisy performance. Ugh, such a laughable, selfish bum. I had to seriously hold back or else my fist would definitely land on his face. Oh, I still had the last chapter to finish. My body was ready to shut down, but I couldn't slack. Not if I wanted to complete it by Louis Beaumont's book launch. He's my favorite author. I'd planned for months to fly to Nice and hand him my manuscript. Suddenly, the lights went out. Guys, looks like the electricity company cut us off because of those unpaid bills. Gosh, we can't live like this. So I pulled out some money from the back of the manuscript. This was money for my niece trip. But this is more urgent. So I gotta do what I have to do. Mom, Dad, here's some money. Just to help out a bit. The next day, Cedric barged into my room with a smug grin on his face. Guess who's going to Paris? Try not to miss me too much, will ya? What? B- but where did you get your money from? Mom and Dad? Duh. Check it out. That's my money? I can't believe this. We don't even have electricity, but they gave him money to go mess around in Paris? I shoved him out of my room and slammed the door shut. I'd always tried my best to not disappoint them, yet they favored my deadbeat brother and spoiled him rotten. All this family stuff was eating me up, so on school day, I confided in Emma. Only when I tried talking to her, she seemed distracted and kept drifting with the music. Em, Em, are you listening? Oh, sorry, but this beat is straight up fire. Look, he's the winner of this contest. Isn't he amazing and talented? I looked at her phone and saw, what? Cedric? So he came to Paris for this stupid contest? Don't talk about him, okay? That's my selfish, uncaring brother I've always talked about. Be his fan, and we can't be friends anymore. Things got even worse when Cedric went home and literally made it rain with his reward money. Chloe, look at all of this money your brother won. Thanks to his talent, we can go back to our old house. Ugh, why is everything so easy for Cedric? He did some nonsense rap and became a celebrity? Meanwhile, it's me who had to give up my trip, my dream. At least we got the old house back, but day after day, these annoying reporters are driving me crazy. How did you come up with meaningful lyrics? Meaningful? Everyone knows rap isn't actually music. It's just some noise full of swearing and insults. Yeah, ignore her. She's just cranky from skipping breakfast. There's no escaping Cedric's name, not even at school. Please, please, please introduce me to him. Why are you so obsessed with him? Don't you remember anything I said about how terrible he is? Come on, give his music a try. I can't believe someone who wrote such beautiful lyrics can be as bad as you say he is. Fine. If she wanted to meet him, then I'd grant her that wish. It's about time she saw his true face. I opened the door and showed Emma inside when suddenly we were covered in a cloud of confetti. Why the long face? My grand welcome was the bomb. Do you know how long it would take to clean this mess? Ugh, Em, this is my brother. An idiot. Idiot brother. Em. But then I turned around to see Emma already soaking up Cedric's every word. I can't take this anymore. My time would be better spent writing. Trembling thoughts. Through fear, your eyes will find mine. Love will bind us like a cat's nine lives. Wow, that's perfect. Wait, that voice sounds unfamiliar. Oh my, this guy was heartthrob-level handsome. Bonjour, I'm Pierre, Cedric's colleague. Is he home? Yes, let me show you the way. What are you seeking him for? We're collaborating on my next album, so I'm here to practice. As a senior singer, I also helped Cedric build his show and industry connections. He's superb, isn't he? After that day, Pierre visited my house more often. Turns out he's a sweet and gentle guy who always brought us gifts, such as flowers and scented candles. And after dinner, he even helped me wash up. How can such an angel work with my devil brother? One day when I was out with Emma, suddenly she looped her arm around me and said, You sure seem chirper these days. It's probably because Cedric's off and away on music shows. You're telling me it has nothing to do with Pierre? Come on, Chloe, it's written all over your face. Fine, he's really sweet and his smile is as bright as the sun. How can I approach someone like him? Hmm, why not start with a love letter? I took Emma's advice and wrote the most romantic letter ever, then brought it to his company. If anyone asks, I'll say I'm here to see my brother. Huh? Are they arguing? I went over to Pierre and asked him what had happened. Oh, it's nothing really. Cedric is just stressed out from his busy schedule. 
Yeah, right. As if there was anything stressful about this nonsense rap thing. Now is my moment, so I stuffed the letter in Pierre's hand, then ran away. I was still giddy with excitement when I arrived home. Only Cedric ruined my mood by sitting there looking like he'd swallowed a wasp. Oh no, are all showbiz parties too tiring? What a tragedy. Shut it, Chloe. What does a dreamer like you know? Dreamer? At least I'm not a self-centered, shallow idiot. I sacrificed everything so you could go after your dumb rap career. And all you do is act like an ungrateful jerk. Grow up and stop being so childish. I expected him to shout back at me, but instead he gave me this dead look, then trudged off to his room. He didn't come down for dinner or anything for the next three days. Hmm, this house sure was quiet without him. But he's a chill guy and things will go back to normal soon, right? I guess I should just enjoy the peace while I could. The next day, Emma showed up at my house all worked up. Is Cedric here? He didn't answer any texts and calls. Huh? You two are messaging each other? Uh, um, I just wonder if he's okay. How typical of you to talk to him behind my back. To my surprise, Emma just impatiently barred past me and ran up to Cedric's room. Then she reappeared with a note. Cedric's gone. Jeez, how irresponsible and impulsive. He really doesn't care about anyone but himself. Enough. I won't listen to you badmouth your brother anymore. Can't you see he's seriously struggling and showing signs of depression? Who's the one who doesn't care about family here? And you really believe you're better than him? Emma's outburst left me stunned. Is Cedric really depressed? How is I meant to know that when he's always goofing around? That evening, Mom and Dad kept fretting about Cedric's disappearance. He gave his all to help us while we could do nothing to help him. Remember those days he performed on the streets? He gave us all the money he earned. And he always tried to cheer us up when things were down. Cedric only wanted to join the rap contest to win some more money. He was very nervous, but we believed in him. So we gave him the money to enter. Oh God, so I misunderstood him all along? Suddenly I remembered his winning track that Emma insisted that I listen to. I went up to my room and turned it on. It's about us, his beloved family. Turns out he wasn't a deadbeat idle loser like I thought he was. He always puts on a happy face to lift other spirits while quietly struggling with his own demons. I needed to find him and apologize immediately, so I went to Pierre for help. I had no idea he was struggling so badly. I should have noticed that he was suffering and not overloaded him with work. But there's an important show coming. If Cedric was a no-show, he'd be in breach of his contract and have to pay a huge sum in compensation. Oh no, that's not good. What should we do now? You know what? You look a lot like Cedric. How about you disguise as him? But how? Don't worry, our makeup team is top-notch. Nobody's gonna know. This all sounded crazy, but it seemed like I had no other choice. My family couldn't be in debt again for this. Being this close to Pierre made my heart flutter. He took me for my makeover, then I learned to lip-sync and perform on stage. I even tried to walk and talk like my brother. I felt bad about deceiving his fans, but I couldn't risk Cedric getting into big trouble. It's only a one-time thing. Sometimes I lip-sync too. It's no big deal. I felt a bit confused. Then suddenly, a stage crew member above me accidentally dropped a wrench. It could have knocked me off if Pierre didn't swoop in and save the day. Now, back to practicing, and oh boy, was it hectic. Pierre stayed with me the whole time and was really supportive. We also never stopped trying to look for Cedric together. I felt our connection growing, but couldn't figure out why he hadn't made any move. Maybe my first letter hadn't been clear enough, so I sneaked into Pierre's room and left him another one. Only later that day, I saw him glued to his phone, so I took a glance. Huh? He was messaging somebody with a very cheesy nickname. Right, he wasn't interested because he was already dating someone else. Oh no, I have to reclaim my second letter before humiliating myself. I ran into his room but couldn't find it anywhere. Wait, what's this? Here comes the big night. I was absolutely terrified. Pierre smiled sweetly at me and held my hands. We shared a look, then stepped on stage together. There were so many people out there. My legs felt numb, but then I spotted Emma beaming at me from the front row, and my nerves eased again. I quickly found the beat, then lip-synced and danced perfectly. But halfway through the song, the stage light suddenly went off and a shadowy figure walked toward me. Cedric! The audience oohed and awed, then clapped in excitement as Cedric continued the rest of the performance. During the break, everyone went backstage and saw Pierre grab Cedric's arm. Cedric, where have you been? We've all been worried sick. Drop the act. 
You're just using me to make yourself rich, forcing me to do show after show, and when I was exhausted, you pushed lip syncing onto me. What are you talking about? These shows are to help you gain support. Starting out in this industry is hard. Hey, I even lent you some money to get your house back. You mean the money you used to tie my brother in with a stupid contract? You compelled Cedric to work exclusively with you, performing two years for free to clear his debt. But according to these receipts for each show, the money he should have received already exceeded the amount he owed you. W what the? Surprised much? Now we have all the evidence against you. So what? Cedric signed it anyway. A contract is a contract. Break it and I'll get you kicked out of the company and make sure you never get any show again. Your whole family will be dirt poor alike before. I don't think so. What would the public say if they knew you've been flirting with him all along? And when he rejected you, you manipulated and overworked him until he agreed to date you. Uh, how long have you known? Long enough to expose you. Now, you have two options. One, cancel the contract within the next 24 hours and pay my brother the excess money you exploited from him. Or two, we'll publish what you did and see if you survive in showbiz afterward. I don't hate you for having feelings for me, but this deal is not fair. Pierre looked nervous and angry, then just stormed off. I turned to my annoying, goofy brother and gave him a big hug. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you before. Why didn't you tell us that you borrowed money to get back our house? I know how much you wanted our house back, so I joined the contest, but the prize money wasn't enough. That's when I asked Pierre. Silly me. If you hadn't found the contract and receipts, I would have still believed his lies and worked till exhaustion. So you did get my message. I was about to shut off all connections to the world. But that day I felt super uneasy, so I opened my phone and saw your message. Must be sibling telepathy. One more thing. Emma, you truly helped me find myself again. What do you say? Do you want to be a superstar rapper's girlfriend? Yes, I do. Please keep the lovey-dovey stuff to a minimum in front of me. Luckily, I was spared when a stage crew called Cedric to go back on stage. You know, it's not easy for us artists to have a big platform, literally like the stage. We always have a price to pay for the glory. Because of that, I'm eternally grateful for my amazing family and friends who always have my back. And a big shout out to my sister for being my inspiration for this song. Then he started rapping to my poetry. His rhymes and my poems are flowing, really getting the crowd going. He's a lyrical gymnastic genius. After the show, Cedric received a video from Pierre. Cedric, I'm sorry for taking advantage of you. I like you so much and wanted to keep you close. I'll pay back what I owe you, then take a break from showbiz for a while. I really hope one day you can forgive me. Phew! All that drama was a lot for my introverted self to handle. So now, I've treated myself to some me time to recharge. Thanks to Cedric rapping, dozens of my publishers reached out to me for my poems, including those who'd previously rejected me. <sighs> Gosh, am I seeing it wrong? A mail from Louis Beaumont himself? I can't wait to see him in person. And you keep working on your dream. Perhaps a secret angel is on the way to bring you a wonderful opportunity. Finally, back in my natural habitat. Now these city kids could see what I'm capable of. Behold, my big, beautiful flame. They were in awe of my skill. When suddenly, the fun was put to an end by some overreacting teachers. They started yelling at me, saying there's a rule against fire. Ugh, how could you call this a campsite if campfire is not even allowed? Fire making is an essential survival skill, y'all. These boring city people don't know a thing. Who needs all their rules anyway? I know I don't. Hi, I'm Nova, the fire hazard. And I didn't always live in the city. I spent the first 14 years of my life on the road. Our family used to travel the country in our RV. We never stayed any place more than a couple of months. We foraged for food and slept under the stars. But my world was flipped upside down when my parents decided to divorce. My mom wanted to settle down and my dad would continue life on the road. I begged to go with dad, but mom had custody of me. I'd love to stay with you, my little birdie, but I have to go. No cage can hold me for too long. At that moment, I promised myself I would break free and spread my wings too. My mom and I then settled into a small two-bedroom apartment in Savannah, Georgia, where we were greeted by our neighbors, Brenda Foster, a middle school teacher, and her son, Scott, who I'd soon be attending school with. 
Mrs. Foster was really friendly, but from the moment I met Scott, I knew we wouldn't get along. City people were always grumpy and glued to their cell phones. Mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. Accountant by day, Burger King employee by night. Her colorful wardrobe was replaced with dull uniforms, and all we ate now was fast food. I still kept a sheer hope that one day, when Mom makes enough money, we will hit the road again soon, but... No, this is going to be our forever home. Things might be hard for you at first, but trust me, it'll be good for you in the long run. That sounds like she wants my life to be this boring and stuffy for all eternity. Then came school. There were tons of rules, and every moment of our day was scheduled. In just one morning, I got in trouble for going to the bathroom and for eating my lunch. And on top of that, every teacher complained about my penmanship and spelling. But things were worse when I was among other kids. I could hear their whispers everywhere I went. One girl even came up to me and asked why I wore weird hippie clothes. My clothes aren't weird, you are! Even when some of them invited me to sit with them at lunch, I felt like an outsider. Anyone down for some pink drinks after school? Not me, I'm saving up for the era's tour. Count me in! I'm entering my pink girl era! None of these words they say makes any sense to me. Finally, they asked about my old life. Well, we didn't have to eat this junk. We can get fresh vegetables by the road. And I know how to skin roadkills. And every day we tried many different fruits and fungi. But be careful, a simple mushroom could kill you. But by that point, I noticed they were either speechless or as pale as a ghost. Did I say something wrong? Every school day was a blur of confusing subjects. But today was my first music lesson, and I was so excited to finally do something I was good at. When the music teacher, Mr. Shapiro, asked if anyone wanted to perform for the class, I sprung up from my seat, ready to go. I confidently sang my favorite song, but halfway through, Mr. Shapiro interrupted me. We're learning classical music. That style is called reggae, which we don't teach here. <laughs> Nova's a hippy-dippy weirdo. The whole class erupted into laughter. What did I do? Ugh, Scott! I was so gonna give him a taste of my rosewood guitar, but everyone held me back. In the end, Mr. Shapiro said he'd be talking with our moms after school. Scott and his mom had already left before my mom came. Mr. Shapiro told her that I was a violent hothead who always dressed inappropriately. I waited for my mom to defend me, but she simply apologized. I'll talk to her about this later. Please excuse her behavior. She has never been to school before. Who was this woman and what had she done to my mother? Later, I told my mom how terrible school was, the constant staring and teasing, the way that everyone seemed to be a little afraid of me. Contrary to my expectation, she told me I should try harder to blend in, and she even had bought me normal clothes for school. Mom, clothes are my self-expression. I'm not changing just to fit in. What happened to you? Didn't you teach me to be myself? I did, but now I need you to blend in so you can make friends. I... I had to leave before bursting into tears. I couldn't stay in the stuffy apartment any longer. So I went out the window, climbed down the fire escape, and just ran away. But at one point, I realized I didn't know where to go. So I wandered around until I bumped into the Fosters, who insisted on walking me back home. Strangely, Scott seemed less annoying now, and kept looking awkwardly at me the whole way home. My mom was clearly surprised to see me when she opened the door. I felt like a joke, because she hasn't even noticed my rebellious great escape. I couldn't sleep that night. After thinking it over, I came to the conclusion that I could get my old life back if I found my dad. If only I knew how. The next morning at school, I went looking for the tools I needed to find my dad. Compass, flashlight, map. Scott? What are you up to in there? You first. I wanted to apologize for what happened in music class yesterday. Your turn. I'm gathering what I need to go find my dad, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Stop you? It looks like you need help. Those things may have helped you hundreds of years ago, but these days we just use the internet. I didn't want Scott's help, but maybe he was right. I had no clue where to start, and I could hardly even figure out how to use my cell phone. <sighs> maybe I need a little help to learn about the internet. Follow me. Scott spent that afternoon teaching me the basics of the internet. He also asked about my old life, and I found myself telling him everything. All the things I missed and hated about this new life. To my surprise, he was understanding. His mother was a single mom too, and it had been years since he heard from his father. After that day, I thought I hated him a bit less. About a week later, I felt like I was ready to start my search. Little did I know, googling my dad's name would give me literally millions of results. I was about to give up when I saw some people looking for their dogs. Hmm, that just gave me an idea. 
I printed as many flyers as the library would allow and spent the next day putting them up around the neighborhood. I was surprised by a strange phone number. Hello? Yeah, hi. I just saw a clueless hippie wandering around and I think they matched the description you provided. I was over the moon by how quick I got a response. But then I saw Scott, half a block away, grinning at me with a cell phone in his hand. That internet thing you taught me is useless. Finding people is not that fast, even with the internet. Your best bet would be the database at the police station. Are you sure you... I didn't need to hear any more words and immediately flagged down a police car passing by. Over here, officer! The officer pulled over and rolled down his window. Morning, sir. Please take us to the station. What are you kids doing? Where are your parents? Well, I'm looking for my dad. I heard the officer speak into his intercom, saying he was bringing a lost child back to the station. Well, that's not what I meant, but whatever does the job, I guess. As he led me into the back of the car, I remembered. Sir, he's with me. Should we bring him too? Correction, two lost kids. Scott was obviously stunned as the police officer escorted us into his car. It's hilarious. <laughs> of course, I need my sidekick with me to help me find that database thingy. Shortly after arriving at the station, the officer left the room to get us some water. As soon as the door closed behind him, I sprung into action. I had to look in every corner, but Scott wasn't helping. Come help me. Where could that database thingy be in this room? What? No, dummy. It's in here. Then he jumped to the computer and did some clicking. Type your dad's name here. Keep an eye out. In an instant, a file with my dad's info came up. I printed it out and sprinted home before the ink could dry. My heart was pounding as I dialed my dad's number. Hey, yo. Dad, it's so good to hear your voice. Uh, who is this? It's me, Dad! Complete silence on the other end. Did I call the wrong number? It's me? Nova? Nova! Glad to hear from you. Guess what, kid? I've been up to all kinds of adventures. Then he talked to me about his amazing trips that I would have loved to be on. Then I asked where he was so I could go find him. I live in the moment, my little birdie. I go where the road takes me. Please, Dad, let me tag along. Okay, meet me at the exit of the interstate at 10 p.m. tomorrow. He ended the call before I could say anything else. I felt the sudden urge to cry for some reason. They must be happy tears. I was finally seeing my dad again. But how could I get there? Maybe my sidekick Scott could help me. If he had made it back from the police station... Oopsies! I ran to Scott's apartment, and to my surprise, he answered the door. Hey, how did you get home? Once I explained to the officer that you were just a little eccentric, he let me go. I'm sorry I left you there. I wasn't really thinking. Oh, I spoke to my dad, and he's picking me up tomorrow night. So, I need your help to get to the highway. The highway? What kind of parent asks his 14-year-old to meet him at the highway at night? Did he even ask you how you were doing? Or your mom? He clearly doesn't care at all. Wait, yeah, he really didn't ask. But dad probably was just busy. We can talk all about it tomorrow when we meet anyway. How dare Scott think ill of him? What do you know about my dad? He's a free spirit, and I should be traveling with him. Life's all about being spontaneous. My mom doesn't even understand it anymore, so I don't expect you to. But if you don't want to help me, fine. I'll figure it out myself. Then I stormed off. The night after, I was struggling with Google Maps. My phone was suddenly snatched out of my hand. I'll take you there. You might get lost if you go alone. I was still a little upset about yesterday, but that was nice of him. Plus, Scott was right. I would get lost on my own. We arrived early and waited. The hours dragged by, so I called Dad several times, but no answer. When I saw it was past 11 p.m., my call finally came through. Oh, man. You were there now? Our bus passed Savannah a while ago. <laughs> we're having a grand party. You should see. Oh, uh, well, maybe we'll cross paths again soon. Bye, little birdie. He hung up right away. I noticed Scott watched me for a reaction, but I couldn't hold it in and burst into tears. Scott got us on the bus to go home. I was sobbing the entire way and couldn't talk through all the tears. Eventually, Scott spoke up. When my parents divorced, I spent a lot of time being mad at my mom, too. I couldn't understand why she didn't make my dad stay. But she did try to, right? Nope. She just accepted it. And I eventually realized that she wasn't weak like I had thought. She chose to stay to make sure my life was normal. Leaving would have been easy. And what she did, keeping the lights on actually took a lot more strength. What Scott said sounded surprisingly mature. After that, we sat in silence for a while. I understood what Scott was saying, but I didn't think it applied to my case. My mom was just not the person she used to be. We arrived home very late. Before we parted, Scott said, Why don't you ask your mom why she decided to settle down here? Kids don't always understand why parents do certain things. Maybe you should hear her out. 
I nodded and took a deep breath before opening the door. My mom was on the phone with the cops, and as soon as she saw me, she ran to give me the biggest hug I had gotten in a long time. She asked me where I'd been, and I told her everything. How I tried to find dad, how he stood me up, and things Scott said earlier. She listened to me attentively, then said what dad did was terrible, but not exactly out of character. You know how we stopped by a town from time to time? Working temporary jobs like waiting tables and washing cars, right? What you didn't know is that your father always messed up and got fired a few days after he started, so he decided that he'd look after you while I worked. I didn't realize how hard mom had always been working while me and dad were just carelessly having fun. Then I asked why she chose that life in the first place. When I met him, I was working a 9 to 5 job that I hated. While your dad was all about, the world is a book, traveling makes you a storyteller. Of course, that sounded fascinating, so I quit my job and set myself free on the RV we bought. But why did you decide to settle down after all these years? After having you, I realized our wandering life wasn't a good environment for a kid. I was worried you'd have a hard time once you got older, especially because your dad wasn't being helpful and was only being a bad example for you. Besides, homeschooling is difficult. We aren't teachers. You deserve to grow up in a stable home, have friends your age, and create deep connections with them. I got you two, and... and people we met from all over the country. That's not enough, honey. I thought I should give you a normal life while you're still young. You'll be better prepared to make your own decisions later as an adult. It was unfair to you. Because you didn't choose that life. We did. The resentment I had towards my mom melted away. In its place was a profound gratitude for all that she sacrificed. I wasn't good with words, so I told her that the best way I could. Do you miss our old life? Well, yes. But for now, you're my number one priority. After the hurt's gone, it was time to heal. I tried to focus on my lessons and learn the rules. My mom even helped me pick out clothes that were more appropriate for school, but still felt like me. I tried my best to enjoy the same movies as other kids and learn to play their favorite songs on my guitar. Soon enough, they became my new friends. I continued to grow even closer to Scott, my friend and partner in crime, from the start. Still, my mom and I agreed that we shouldn't totally abandon our love for travel, and she promised that we would plan a few big road trips every year, starting this summer. I can hardly wait for our trip to Niagara Falls with Mrs. Foster and Scott. Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table, so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%. Cereal is $2.49. Potatoes, laundry detergent. So the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades. And by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye. 
in the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon. So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive. Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. 
I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them, and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air, and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Y yeah And an opportunity is coming your way. There's an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight now! Suddenly, a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did and you were... The only one who had truly been kind to me. <sighs> only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey, Laura, what are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot in our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sank to my toes and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. 
It's all right. I, I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood, but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Yes? So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little taller. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life! Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself. I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you, arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. So, here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great, but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad, I will make you proud. Hey, Milo here, and let me tell you something about love. Well, love totally sucks. At least that's how I felt after my cheating ex Deanna broke my heart. Ouch. Deanna's 16 months and 15 days older than me. Not that I was counting or anything. I first met her in the park one morning. The heel on her shoe had broken, and being a sucker for a damsel in distress, I ran to the nearest store and bought her an emergency pair of flip-flops. She offered to take me out to lunch to say thank you. Then we hit it off. And that's how we started dating. We quickly fell madly in love despite the age difference. But then she had to go off to college. But it would just take a year being apart from each other because she'd made me promise to apply to the same school as her so we could be together. The future sounded amazing. I couldn't wait till graduation and start a new life with her in a new city. It was our 10 month anniversary. So I tried to be romantic and showed up at her place with a surprise bunch of flowers. But that's when I caught her in bed with some college guy. Talk about a bummer. I actually think I felt my heart snapped in two. I was so angry, I threw the bouquet to the ground and didn't forget to stomp on them a few times on my way out. So I took the train home and turned into that miserable guy who hates love. To make it even worse, Valentine's Day was approaching and loved up couples were everywhere. Ugh, what a disgusting sight. If I couldn't have a happy Valentine's Day, then neither could anyone else. So I decided to mess with them. My friends were the money-making kind. So naturally, they wanted to cash in on the day of love. If your heart is still intact, then you have no idea how much it sucks feeling heartbroken and being surrounded by chocolates, flowers, and fluffy teddy bears holding hearts. But I'd already agreed to help them as I figured I could spend the extra money on a gift for Deanna. But obviously, this was pointless now. I'm not the kind of guy to bail on my friends. So that's why I ended up in the park with a pull cart full of soppy items. Ugh. There were gooey eyes couples everywhere. I didn't know if I wanted to vomit or scream. I saw a couple walking toward me, so I decided to make this more interesting. Hello, sir. Can I interest you in a beautiful bouquet of roses to show your lovely mother here how much you love her? He stared at me in confusion and clumsily said no while the girlfriend glared at me in anger as they're walking away. 
She kept hitting her boyfriend's arm, asking in an annoying, girly tone, Why didn't you tell him I wasn't your mom? Do I look that old? I can't believe this. You didn't even correct him. And then the guy had to calm her down in despair. <laughs> Priceless. After that, I said it to every couple that came up to me. But then one of my friends noticed that I was chasing customers away with my dumb jokes. So she kicked me off the project. Oh well, it beat being around lovesick couples. So the day after, I had no schedule and was sitting in my bedroom watching an action film that had no romance in it and minding my own business when my sister barged into my room and told me that I had to babysit the neighbor's kid so she could go on some spontaneous date with her boyfriend. Apparently, our parents decided last minute to go out of town. So seeing as my sister's still dating in secret, her and her boyfriend thought that this was the perfect timing for them to hang out. Of course, I didn't agree to babysit, but she led the little kid into my room, said to me, It's not like you have any Valentine plans anyway. Then she ran off. This little brat. Unlike my sister, I wasn't just going to abandon some little kid. So I begrudgingly took her to the mall and bought her an ice cream. When she finished that, she started whining at me that she wanted candy. Ugh, yawn. Kids are draining. Looking around at all the loved-up couples, I had a eureka moment. I told her I'd buy all the candy she wanted if she went up to this one couple, hugged the guy, and said, Daddy, let's go home. I miss Mom. Turns out, she's a little daredevil, and she did it without question. Watching the shocked look on their faces was priceless. After a while of doing this, I bought the kid candy as promised. We sat on the bench laughing while thinking back on our achievement. <laughs> we had so much fun. Then, I spotted a girl who turned me down in middle school. She was there with some guy. I quickly told the kid to hide behind the bench and winked, Watch and learn, noob. Then I marched up to them, grabbed the guy's wrist, and yelled, So, is it because of this girl that we had to break up, you heartless swine? Then I ran off pretending to cry. I hid behind the bench with the kid. Both of us laughed our heads off and ate candy as we watched the couple fighting in confusion. After a while, I dropped the kid back home. Then I went back to mine. Through the window, I saw that my sister and her boyfriend had already been back from their date and were saying goodbye outside. So I sneaked a pic of them. I couldn't wait to blackmail her with that and demand her to pay me extra money so that our parents wouldn't know about them. I waited in the living room with a smirk on my face. But ten minutes passed and she still hadn't appeared. I looked through the window to see them kissing for like the zillionth time already. Ugh. She clearly didn't spare a thought for her heartbroken brother. So I decided to be Cupid and grant them their wish. I raced outside with a big roll of duct tape and ran circles around them as I stuck their heads together when they were kissing. Now that is the best way to de-stress. I felt much lighter with every lap I ran. They both screamed out and tried to pull free, but they were well and truly stuck. So I left them there to untangle themselves and I whizzed off. The next morning, my sister gave me the most furious look across the table during breakfast. I swear there was fire in her eyes. But too bad she couldn't do anything to me as mom was right there. I can even see a little bruise on her forehead as a result of my prank. I had to try so hard to hold my laughter. I felt this tingling feeling between the thrill and satisfaction which made me totally forget about my failed relationship. I got such a kick out of messing with people's perfect love lives. And so I continued with my pranks on unsuspecting couples. Then, one time I walked up to a couple in the street and said to the girl, Why are you here? Didn't you say you're working overtime? Can't I trust you anymore? I'll be home waiting for your explanation. Then walked off while giggling. But this time, a hand suddenly grabbed my shoulder. Then as I turned around, the guy punched me. Then I passed out. Talk about embarrassing. I woke up dazed and confused on the sidewalk with this cute girl looking down at me. The guy had left, thank goodness. The girl seemed so relieved that I'd woken up. And she kept telling me that I must have mistaken her with someone else because she didn't know me at all. I was too embarrassed, so I had to nod in agreement. She called a taxi and helped me get home. On the ride, she apologized because her boyfriend had a short temper, and they were already arguing at that moment. She told me her name was Vanessa. Then we switched contact details so she could check up on me. Then, one morning at school, I noticed her in the hallway. Turns out she went to my school, but I'd never spotted her before. She saw me too and smiled and waved over at me. We started spending lunch times together. She bought me cheese fries and gave me her delicious homemade cookies. She said she wanted to make it up to me. 
we unintentionally grew closer, and the next thing I knew, I found myself really fond of this girl. But she's taken, and it's with a jerk. She told me all about her boyfriend. He's called Kane, and he went to a different school, thankfully. She said he was a sweet guy, but sometimes he lashed out, and one time, he even hit her. It's clear her boyfriend's a doofus, but she was too blinded by love to see it. I wanted to whisk her away and show her what being with a good guy was really like. But to be honest, I was scared of being beaten up by him again. I opened up to her about my ex and how she messed me up. Vanessa listened and never judged. I felt so at ease being around her. Then one afternoon, I saw her in the hallway after class, and it looked like she'd been crying. So I went up to her and said, Vanessa, are you okay? She forced out a smile and replied, Yeah, it's just boyfriend stuff. That's the moment when I decided that enough was enough. Scary boyfriend or not, no matter what it takes, I had to tell her my feelings and save her from him. I offered to drive her home. Then I planned to confess my feelings to her on the way home. But to my annoyance, she said it's okay as her sister was picking her up that day. Then she waved goodbye to me and ran over to a car. Wait a minute. I knew that car. Her sister, the girl in the car. That was my ex. Talk about a dilemma. How on earth did this happen? I swore to never see my ex again. I couldn't bear the thought of breathing the same air as her, but now I had a crush on her sister. Help! To make it even worse, I've told Vanessa all about how much I hate my ex. How could I let her know that the ex in question turned out to be her sister? Ugh, help me. This is so crazy, and I have no idea how to wriggle my way out of this one. Hey guys, it's me, Milo. I'm back again to share the next part of my story with you. Firstly... Here's a quick recap. So my ex Deanna cheated on me with some college doofus, and in doing so broke my heart. So I decided that if I couldn't be happy, then neither could anyone else. So around Valentine's Day, I messed with other couples. One such prank led me to meet Vanessa. Then I found myself falling for her. The problem is she has a boyfriend, and he's a jerk. And the even bigger problem is that I just found out that she's my ex's little sister and there's a chance I may have told Vanessa some pretty harsh truths about her sister. But in my defense back then, I didn't realize they were siblings. At first, I had no idea how to deal with the situation, so I just decided to avoid everyone. If I saw Vanessa at school, then I darted around the corner into the restroom behind an overweight kid. You know, anything that meant I didn't have to face her. The problem was I found myself missing her too much. I felt like I couldn't live without her. So no matter the consequences, I had to do something now. So I walked up to her at lunch and told her I'd been avoiding her because I couldn't cope with seeing her so upset over her boyfriend that didn't deserve her and it was wrong of him to hit her and she should get out now while she still could. Then I told her I'd always be there for her and hopefully as more than just friends. She seemed touched. She knew there were a lot of problems in their relationship too but admitted she'd been in denial about it all. She held my hand and said that she had feelings for me too but now we had to deal with her boyfriend first. Ugh. Her boyfriend, Kane. He was the short-tempered kind of guy who solves everything with a punch. He will never accept it if she breaks up with him. It would dent his pride too much, and probably result in him being violent toward her. While to be honest, I'm too much of a coward. I couldn't protect her in that case. If he knew she was breaking up with him to be with me, well, then that's the end for me. So I thought long and hard about this, and then, voila! I derived a master plan. If he couldn't handle Vanessa breaking up with him, then we'll make him break up with her. <laughs> wow, <laughs> am I a genius or what? The next day I told Vanessa the plan. It's simple. She just needs to intentionally look sloppy, stinky, and ugly in front of him so he would soon tire of her. When she first heard it, she wasn't impressed and said, that's so embarrassing, I can't do that. No girl wants to look like a mess. I told her that she would only have to do it in front of him. Besides, he went to a different school to us so she could still look like her usual pretty self in class. Eventually, she agreed to do it. And as I expected, just after a few weeks of playing ugly, Kane had enough and broke up with her. Vanessa came around to mine and excitedly told me the news. She'd gone to Kane's place without any makeup on, wearing some stained oversized shirt, her hair a mess, and she hadn't even brushed her teeth. Then when he ended it with her, she pretended to cry. <laughs> I couldn't believe this good girl could act pretty well too. Then, seizing the occasion, I asked her to be my girlfriend, and she of course said yes. Then we kissed, and well, talk about amazing. She was such a better kisser than her sister. 
We kept our relationship low-key at first. This worked for her as she didn't want to rub our relationship in Kane's face. And it worked for me as I didn't want Deanna to find out. Then, after a month of dating, she dropped the bomb. I want you to meet my sister. She's in college and lives in another city, but she's currently home for vacation. I should officially introduce you to her first, since we don't know when she will leave again. I could have screamed out, but instead, I kept my cool and asked to see a picture of her. Then on seeing one, I feigned being shocked and said that this girl always picked on me during middle school and I was still traumatized from it. That those were the darkest years of my life. I mean, I didn't actually know Deanna back in middle school, probably because she was a year older than me, but Vanessa didn't need to know this. Vanessa felt bad for me and said she didn't know that there was that side to her sister. She said it was true that Deanna was pretty cranky in middle school, but thought that that was just puberty. She never realized she was actually a mean girl, especially not to a younger kid. By this point, I might as well have been cast in some soap opera as my performance was a class act. I must have looked so pathetic that she told me it's okay, and she'd not mentioned Deanna anymore until I felt comfortable about it. This solved my ex problem, for now, but it didn't solve the Kane problem, as he found out about Vanessa and me, and he wasn't happy. My guess is Kane must have stalked Vanessa and spotted us together. Then he followed me home, as that crazy dude showed up on my doorstep and yelled at me to stay away from her. Well, I couldn't blame him. No one on earth ever likes their ex's new partner. Not only did this crazy guy know where I lived, but now my sister Kayla also knew about my relationship with Vanessa. Since she's still bitter about the Valentine prank I pulled on her, recap, it involved her, her boyfriend, and a whole lot of duct tape. So it wasn't overly surprising when she smirked at me and said, just you wait and see. I haven't forgot about what you did to me on Valentine's, and now seems like the perfect time for revenge. <laughs> I repeated her words in a mocking tone to annoy her, but to be honest, deep down in my gut, I did feel on the anxious side. She's just as crazy of a prankster as I am. Now, I always had to be on guard. After that, my sister and Kane seemed to take turns to ruin our dates. Jeez, didn't they have anything better to do? One time, I was kissing Vanessa out in the yard, Suddenly, there was water pouring down from nowhere. We were completely soaked. I looked around and saw my sister standing on the second floor balcony, holding an empty bucket and said, Oops, I was just trying to water the flowers. Then, on a movie date night, Kane showed up at the same film, sat in the row behind us, and kept on kicking the back of my seat, and even threw popcorn at me. Later, when I went home and checked the hood of my hoodie, there were all kinds of trash and enough popcorn for the next movie date. How childish. It was all trivial stuff, really, but it was getting annoying. Then, on our two-month anniversary, I told Vanessa to dress up all nice, then I took her to the swanky Italian restaurant. The meal was amazing, until when I reached into my pocket and took out my wallet to pay. Then, to my horror, a picture of a bikini-wearing girl fell out of nowhere. I was so shocked and just froze in confusion. Vanessa looked so upset. I explained that I'd never seen that picture before in my life, and I had no idea who the girl was. Then the waiter showed up with the card machine. I clumsily opened my wallet, but none of my cards were there. I searched my pockets again in panic, but nothing, not even a penny. Bright red, I muttered out that I had no money on me. This was the worst moment of my life. I thought I was going to lose my girlfriend and have to pot wash. But then I heard arguing coming from outside. Me, Vanessa, and the waiter all stared out the window and saw my sister and Kane yelling at each other. We stepped outside and listened in on their conversation. Turns out my sister had taken all the cards out of my wallet so I wouldn't be able to pay. She's been peeking in from the window all night long and spying on us, just to wait and see my pathetic face as I found out that all of my cards have vanished into thin air. But then she was disappointed that it didn't go to plan because I was busy explaining to Vanessa about some stupid photo instead. That's when she met eyes with some crazy guy who was standing next to her and laughing his ass off in satisfaction which you can already tell who he was, the mastermind of that bikini photo prank. Kayla got annoyed and picked a fight with Kane because now she felt like her prank had been overlooked and she wasn't happy about it. It's kind of dumb, really. As if they weren't so proud and headstrong, they could have watched me miserably try to squirm my way out of the no cards and picture of another girl fiasco. Instead, they'd been caught red-handed setting me up. Vanessa pointed at Kane and said to the waiter, he'll pay for our meal. Then she grabbed my arm and pulled me away. So yeah, we left my sister and Kane to their arguing, and I took Vanessa home. 
Then, a few days later, Kane sent me a message. It's amazing what delving into your past can bring up. I know all about you and Deanna. Set me up on a date with your sister or else I'll tell Vanessa everything. Dang it. Who would have thought after that stupid incident that crazy Kane guy would catch feelings for my evil little sister? In hot sweats, I replied that my sister already had a boyfriend. Unsurprisingly, Kane didn't care about this factor. He told me a time and a place and said my sister better be there else he wouldn't just tell Vanessa about Deanna. He'd also 100% ruin my life. OMG, what am I supposed to do now? Do I really have to set up a date for my little sister with a crazy guy like Kane? Oh well, she's not really sane either, but she's still my sister. But if I don't agree to help him, then who knows what could happen to me tomorrow? I mean, I don't want Vanessa to find out about Deanna. And I also don't... Hey guys, Milo here. Again, I'm going to share with you the final part of my awesome story. And trust me, you won't want to miss it. For those of you who are struggling to keep up, in the second part, I decided to make a move with Vanessa, despite knowing that she's the little sister of my horrible ex. And also, she was dating this thug, Kane. The only thing that matters is that she had feelings for me too. So I convinced Vanessa to dress sloppily so Kane would end it with her. Of course, my genius plan worked. Then we started dating officially. But I didn't want Vanessa to find out the truth about my past relationship with her sister. So I made up some ridiculous story to her about how I wasn't ready to face seeing her beloved sis yet, as she was the mean girl that had made my life a living hell back in middle school. Anyway, Kane found out about Deanna being my ex, and now he's threatening to tell Vanessa everything unless I set him up on a date with my sister Kayla. I know, complicated, huh? I swear my life is just one big soap opera. Anyway, tuck luff, sis. Seems like you have a date with Creepy Kane this Saturday. Okay, so the fact she already has a boyfriend makes things somewhat complicated. I guess there was only one thing for it. I just have to trick her into going on the date. So, Kayla loves singing. I mean, she's tone deaf, but she thinks she's Katy Perry or something. So I figured that the most logical way to trick her into meeting Kane was to come up with some story about a talent agent being interested in her. I told her that I had a friend who had a friend who knew a talent agent, and this agent would just love to have dinner with her on Saturday and talk about her career. At first, she raised her eyebrow and said, as if. So I let out a long sigh, then replied, as much as it pains me to admit that you have talent, well, you do, so meet the agent or don't, as if I care. I shrugged, then I walked off. I hadn't got far when she shouted after me, yeah, okay, I'll be there. Result, I knew that my sister wouldn't be able to resist the prospect of getting one up on me. It's a shame for her that this would never happen. Of course, I wasn't a complete jerk. Kane's a volatile idiot. So the least I could do was secretly follow her to make sure she was safe. I sat in the restaurant in my sunglasses, stick on mustache and baseball cap. Talk about the master of disguise. I should open up a spy business. Kayla was far too busy droning on about herself to notice me. She didn't seem to recognize Kane as being Vanessa's ex either. Probably because he'd actually washed his hair. And was that aftershave I could smell? I overheard her say to him, So do you really think I can make it as a singer? Kane looked confused, but he just shrugged and said, Um, yeah, sure. Even though she wouldn't quit going on about her singing, he still continued to flirt with her. Lame things like he told her she looked pretty and stroked her arm. Ugh. At one point, Kayla started singing. Kane looked dumbfounded, and the waiter walking past actually covered his ears. It was so funny, even I couldn't help but laugh out loud. Then she must have had a light bulb moment about who he was, as she gave him a scrutinizing look, stood up, then said, Wait a minute, um, yeah, excuse me? I, I need the bathroom. As she stormed across the room, I knew she was bailing. Oh no, if she did that, then Kane would tell Vanessa everything and my life would be over. So I hurried after her and shouted her name. At first, she gave me a weird look, so I removed my sunglasses and fake mustache. She looked pretty mad. But I knew that I had to tell her all about how Kane was blackmailing me. I even managed to fake some tears. At first, she seemed furious and she shouted at me. 
a lot. But then she seemed to calm down and she smirked. Uh-oh. That smirk. Didn't look good. She told me, okay, I'll go back inside. But this means you have to do everything I say. All month. I didn't like the sound of this, but I had little choice. So I agreed. She went back inside and the date seemed to go well. The problem was now I didn't have to worry about Kane. Instead, I had to worry about my sister. Why do these situations happen to me? Has karma for messing with all those couples come back to bite me? I had to do all Kayla's chores, including staying home every weekend to babysit the kid next door. <clears throat> then I also had to message her actual boyfriend and apologize for the Valentine's prank I played on him. A reminder for you, it involved my super speed and a whole lot of duct tape. Things got weirder, though, as Kane seemed totally smitten with my sister. He sent her flowers, then he sent her a giant teddy bear. And he even messaged me saying he wanted to assure me he would never hurt her. Okay, this was weird. It seems my sister had made the once thug-like cane turn soft. Thing is, she binned his flowers, gave the teddy to the neighbor's kid, and, well, made it clear she didn't like him. Wow. Love can really mess someone up. Even someone like Cain. I guess he liked her coldness toward him. I suppose it's far more of a challenge than being with someone all kind and sweet like Vanessa. Kayla had started selling home-baked goods. You know, cookies and things. They were tough, burned, and gross, but people seemed to buy them. So guess who she roped into playing delivery driver? Urgh, talk about lame. What made it even worse was I had a date with Vanessa one day. But no, now I had to deliver inedible biscuits. Being the smart guy I am, I found a way to get around this. So I picked Vanessa up from the library, then went off to make the deliveries. The plan was to drop them off as quickly as possible, then Vanessa and I could have date night. Vanessa didn't mind. In fact, she thought it was sweet that I was helping Kayla out. Ha! <laughs> we got to the delivery address, and it was a nail salon. I left Vanessa in the car and rushed inside. Then I saw who the customer was, and oh my god. There standing in front of me was Deanna. Talk about a shocker. I was so surprised that I actually dropped the delivery. I muttered out something about how my sister would reimburse her. Then I went to leave. She grabbed my arm and said she wanted to apologize to me properly for cheating on me. Now was not the time for this. Talk about awkward. I tried to yank my arm away, but she kept clinging to me. Then Vanessa suddenly walked in. I guess she must have seen us through the shop window. She yelled out, Deanna, what are you doing? Let him go. Stop being so mean. I didn't want to believe that you ever teased him back in middle school, but here's the proof. Deanna looked confused as she replied, what are you doing here? And what do you mean tease? They yelled back and forth in confusion for a while until Deanna blurted out, he's my ex-boyfriend. Cue two furious women staring at me in anger, asking for an explanation. Now would be the perfect time for a UFO to come and abduct me, but no such luck. I had some explaining to do, so we went to the coffee shop next door, and I confessed that Deanna was actually my ex. But I only found out about it after dating Vanessa, so I lied because I didn't know how to handle that awkward situation. I begged them for forgiveness. I was so scared. I was basically staring down at the table the whole time. But then suddenly, I heard giggles. Deanna started to laugh and said, That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Oh my, Milo. Vanessa joined in. Okay, that makes sense, since he's the one who also came up with the ridiculous plan for me to break up with my ex by playing ugly. He really has a unique sense of solving problems. Okay, so I never thought they'd find any of this funny, but at least they're not mad at me. So in the end, I got a proper apology from Deanna. We're cool now. And I can freely date Vanessa too. Turns out life is far simpler when you don't end up in a web of lies. As for Kane, well, he doesn't bother Vanessa anymore. Instead, he's still pining after my sister. I actually think he might have a chance with her as she broke up with her boyfriend because that dude has been constantly bailing on her to hang out with his friends. Even though I've seen a different side to Kane, I don't know how I'd feel about having him as my actual brother-in-law one day. <laughs> but yeah, I got the girl, so everything turned out pretty great. As for pranks, well, I can't rule out never doing the odd one or two in the future, 
but I promise to never mess with loved up couples again. I've learned my lesson on that one. I'm Sarah, and at 17, I was the new girl in a super prestigious school. This sudden move wasn't down to anything bad. It's not like I hated my old school or anything, but just like a winning lottery ticket that my father spent his amazing career to get. You see, my dad was a firefighter, and last summer there was a fire that completely burned down this mansion. My dad knew there was someone still in there, so he ignored all his teammates' warnings then went into the burning building to rescue them alone. He found a girl around my age trapped in her room and rushed in to rescue her. But as he hugged the girl and ran out of the fire, a burning wooden beam fell on his leg. That was when my hero dad used his incredible strength he had left to get rid of it and carried the girl out of the building. Once he went out and checked if the girl was safe, he collapsed in his comrade's arms. He'd saved her life, but he was left with a pretty bad injury on his leg, which meant he couldn't do his job anymore. Being a fireman was all his life. He was so devastated that I couldn't even recognize him, until an unexpected fortune came to our family. The owner of the mansion, Mr. Adams, came to our front door one day. He was so grateful to my dad for saving his daughter's life that he offered him anything he wanted. Mr. Adams is a super wealthy businessman, but my dad didn't want his money, but there was one thing he agreed on. There's this private school. Well, it's not just any private school. It's where kids of politicians, celebrities, and big business tycoons go. Mr. Adams organized for me to go there too. Oh, MG, it was so crazy. I'd be in the same class as the kids of A-list celebrities. I was so worried if I could fit in that new environment. But Mr. Adams said that his daughter Ashley went there too, and she would help me a lot and I could see how happy my dad was after a long, devastating time. So, yes, my first day of school was so different than I imagined. Ashley had to delay going back to school for a month because she still hadn't recovered all her skin damage yet. So I ended up going alone. So, wow, this school was amazing. Seriously, take luxury and times it by about 100. Even the lockers were super expensive looking. I was afraid that if I scratched it, there was no way my parents would be able to afford the repairs. Not only were the facilities out of this world, but the students there were something else too. They looked so classy in stylish and expensive clothes. Even though the school had a uniform, it seemed like the only one wearing it was, well, it was me. Ugh, as bad as the uniform was, the thought of showing up in my cheap casual clothes was far worse. When I entered the classroom, everyone stared at me and looked me up and down. Then this glamorous girl walked over to me and said, So, who are your parents, newbie? I froze. I didn't expect this to be her first question, but it said a lot. Obviously, status here was important, so I knew that telling them my father was just a firefighter who would quit his job due to an injury, and I was here as a reward for his sacrifice, wouldn't cut it. I blurted out, Mr. Adams. Now where can I sit? All of them were surprised. Another girl showed me an empty space at the front table. Looking at their attitude, I guessed Mr. Adams had been a very famous man in their world. The other girl stayed out of my way after that, but I could feel this one girl's glaring eyes on me. I knew I wasn't done with her. The next day, when I was by my locker, she came over with her group of friends and said, Newbie, I know you're lying. Mr. Adams only has one daughter, Ashley, and she's my friend. Oh, no. This wasn't good. I tried to remain calm and replied, I'm more than his daughter. He owes me and my family. They all looked surprised as I walked off, but hey, I didn't lie. He really does owe my family. If they happen to think this is down to debt or power, well, then that's not my fault, is it? That was not all. This school had some weird rules. It doesn't have regular high school clubs like music, chess, or cheerleading. Nope. Here, it's all down to status. There's a club for the celebrity kids, a club for the politicians' kids, and so on. I found this strange. 
Could no one here be themselves without clinging on to their parents' fame? Anyway, one week into school, and I was told that I had to attend my club meeting after school. Oh, so they themselves put me in a child-of-something family group. I didn't want to be classified as a dissident by themselves, too, so I reluctantly go to the hall to attend. I sat at the back of the room. It seemed to be a club for business tycoons kids. Jeez, it was so boring. So boring, in fact, that I was pretty sure the kid sitting next to me was sleeping. A boy whose dad owns one of the mega-big companies droned on about how his father donated millions to the school. Worse still, everyone clapped and cheered him as if he'd saved the world or something. After half an hour of this fakeness, I'd had enough. So, glided past the sleeping guy so I could escape. But being the clumsy girl I am, I accidentally knocked his earphone jack slip out. Cue the loudest rumbling of music. Oops. The boy sat up and calmly turned off his music. I was still standing there with everyone looking at me. When Mauve said, Sarah, isn't it? Are you going somewhere? At least you should tell us what your family has done for this school. Or you think you can just enjoy the perks of this club? Confused, I blurted out, It's not like I need all this drama anyway. Oh, is that so? Mauve glared at me. I was about to gather up my stuff and hurry out of there when the guy beside me stood up and said, She's right. No one cares about your dumb perks. This club is so boring it actually sent me to sleep. The room fell silent. This boy pulled me out of there. Wow, who was this boy to say such a thing? I have to admit, I was kind of impressed, but also shocked. Out in the foyer, he turned to me and said, I'm Noah. It's nice to meet an interesting girl like you. OMG, this Noah boy was so handsome. Before I could even think up a reply, he turned around and walked off. And wait, had he just said that I was interesting? Anyway, I didn't need any friends here. They all seemed so fake. All I needed to do was put my all into my studies and make the most of the education on offer here. The best class for me by far was art, and more specifically, plaster making. I loved creating plaster figures. I just got so absorbed into the art of it. Once I was working on my sculpture, when this girl called Claire came up to me and whispered, Are you on your period? Come with me to my locker if you need clothes to change into. I looked down at my skirt, and yep, she was right. Of course, I didn't have a backup outfit. Seeing me flustered, she suddenly took her Chanel tweed jacket off and tied it around my waist. Oh my god, what if I got it dirty? My panic continued when I saw inside of her locker. Wow, all of the items in there must have cost at least four digits. She grabbed this pretty dress, then pushed me toward the toilets. I changed into the dress. I'd never worn anything so expensive before. I stepped out of the cubicle, and she smiled and said, You look amazing. I knew this color would complement your skin tone. Turns out that not only did she know loads about fashion, but she was also the sweetest girl. After that, I grew closer to Claire. But there was one thing I didn't understand. Why didn't an amazing girl like Claire have any other friends? One time during lunch, I asked her this, and she replied, My mom's a famous actress, but she was afraid having me would affect her career, so she had me in secret. So here, I'm a nobody. But it's okay, because now I have you, and my amazing clothes, of course. Claire had shared her secret with me, so it seemed only fair that I shared mine. So I told her all about my dad and why I was really at this school. She hugged me and told me my dad was a true hero and I deserved my place at this school, far more than any of the other kids. It felt good having Claire to confide in and was proof to me that not all the kids at this school were brats. Then one day, I walked into the class to see this pretty girl sitting at my table. Loads of kids surrounded her like she was royalty or something. She caught my eye and rushed over and hugged me and said, I'll be forever grateful for what your father did for me. I'm so happy to have you as a sister, Sarah. It turns out that she was Ashley, the daughter of Mr. Adams. She invited me to have lunch with her, and I didn't want to be rude. I mean, it was Ashley's first day back and all. I spotted Claire alone on our usual table, and she looked sad when she saw where I was. I was going to ask Ashley if she could join us, 
but then I noticed that Claire had already left the cafeteria. I felt so out of place, as all they talked about was business news and their previous vacations to luxury hotels and private islands. Then suddenly this handsome boy came over and sat down next to Ashley. Wait, I recognized him. It was that Noah kid. Then he looked at Ashley and said, Hey, long time no see. Oh, he speaks, another girl said. I was beginning to think you only want to know us when Ashley's around. Noah replied, I have stuff I need to ask this girl. Another girl joked, Stuff involving a fiancé and his bride-to-be, is it? They all laughed, and I saw Ashley turn bright red. Then she turned to me and said, Sarah, this is Noah, my boyfriend. And Noah, this is Sarah, the girl my father has told you about. What? He is her boyfriend? I looked in his direction, and our eyes met. Sarah here again. So thanks to my hero father, I'd been transferred to a private school where all the rich and famous people's kids went. It was so amazing to study at this luxurious school, but the one downside was I felt like such an oddball there until Ashley, the girl whose life my father had saved, came back to school and was super friendly to me. Also, there was this one boy who caught my eye called Noah. He seemed so rebellious, but kind of friendly and normal to me somehow. But then, shocker, I found out he was Ashley's boyfriend. After introducing us, Ashley spotted Noah looking at me in a weird way and surprisingly said, Oh, so you guys know each other, huh? He muttered out, Yes, I saw this girl once in the club. Um, uh, what club was it? I couldn't remember the name of the club either, so I just sat there smiling awkward. Ashley replied, Oh, right, then stroked Noah's arm. To be honest, I felt kind of disappointed learning the fact that Noah and Ashley were a couple. Because, you know, I did think about Noah a lot since the day I first met him. He stood up to save me from the awkward situation. Then he even said that I was interesting. And yes, this guy was beyond handsome. But what was I thinking? This world is not for me. I should just live quietly, focus on my study, then leave with a good profile for college admissions. Nothing more. After that, I didn't see much of Noah around school. Well, at least I didn't until we ended up in the same new drawing class. In the very first study, our teacher arranged for us to have a trip to a local art museum so we could have first impressions with modern art. I wandered off and studied the different paintings. Then a painting caught my eyes and made me stop to look at it. It was of a wildfire. At first glance, I noticed the off-balanced color scheme and layout— Moreover, in the scene of the fierce fire, destruction, and death, I sympathized with the creatures running away from the fire. My heart suddenly lightened as I thought about the courage of my father. Suddenly, I heard a voice behind me. Looks intense, huh? The fire which enlightens is the same fire which consumes. I turned around, feeling a little surprised when I saw Noah. Then I smiled. You know Henry Emil? I've read some of his books. I blurted out, wow, you don't look like someone who likes to read about philosophy. Ugh, talk about a cringy comment. But Noah just smiled and said, so you like his painting? Yeah, my life has turned to a new page just because of a fire. After that, we analyzed the special features of the painting, and turns out, as well as being cute, he's pretty smart too. Then I looked up and saw him looking at me. I don't know, perhaps it was because we felt the same way about the painting, but I found myself feeling a special connection toward him. Since he kept looking at me like that, I pretended to cough and then Noah stroked my head and walked away. Oh dear, what did he just do? My heart was beating so fast and my face turned as red as a tomato, but then I just told myself that a pat on the head may mean nothing to him, right? Still, that night I couldn't stop thinking about him. Maybe he liked me, but no, I dismissed that thought. He was with Ashley, so I mustn't think about this anymore. The next morning at school, I was working on my plaster statue when suddenly someone swiped it. 
I watched in horror as it fell to the ground and lay there in a squashed-up mess. Oh, sorry, a girl said in a sarcastic tone. It's like you don't need all this drama and stuff around you. Jeez, I recognized her. It was that mauve girl, the one who hosted my former club. Are you obsessed with me that much? Leave me alone. I fumed while sitting there trying to save the shape of my statue. Oh, it's not that easy, babe. Let me tell you the first perk of our club, living in peace. All of her friends laughed along while Mob stepped up, aiming at my statue again. At that moment, another voice piped up from the back of our class. Do you want me to smash up yours too, or are you going to apologize properly to her? That's when I saw Noah standing next to Mob's statue, wobbling it back and forth. Noah, why do you keep protecting her? Is she important to you? You just need to know that if you keep causing trouble to her, you'll have me to answer. Then he continued to wobble the stretcher and said, Now, it's your call. Fine, I'm very sorry. She rolled her eyes at me before she stormed over to her statue. Noah stopped wobbling it, then walked over to me and tried to help me with my statue. His clumsiness just made the shape getting worse, but made my heart melted before my mind could help it. Sorry, seems like I ruined this thing more than she did. He looks at me with guilty eyes. No. You're helping me to make a fresh start instead of fixing it. He just laughed. We have to start too, Sarah. Do you see their angry eyes? We're in the same boat now. I looked over his shoulder to see the girls were fuming. But wait, Ashley was there too, and she looked not so happy. She walked over to me, hugged Noah around the neck, and said, Noah, I'm hungry. Can we go to the canteen? Then she turned back to give me a dirty look before they left. That look was her warning. For me. Okay, I definitely needed to keep my distance from Noah from now on. She had her reason for doing so, I could understand. Noah had never cared about anything at school, but now he even made friends with me. That must make her feel insecure. The problem was I just seemed to keep running into him. Speaking of which, after school I was getting my bike when he appeared. Feeling flustered, I thanked him again for earlier. He replied, Don't just say thank you. How about a coffee? Things with Ashley were hostile enough, so I replied, Sorry, Noah, I have a family thing. And also, it's a little awkward with, you know, Ashley, don't you think? At first, he looked confused, but then he shrugged and said, Okay, then walked off. Noah was such a sweet guy, but staying away from him was for the best, right? Besides, Claire had asked me to go over to her house to try out some of the new items that she just designed. We ate pizza, watched a movie together, and looked at the collection that she just finished. She photographed me in some of the clothes, and I posed like a professional model. We had so much fun. I had an amazing friend that was enough for high school life. No more other feelings, no more drama. But one day not long after that, when I was walking through the hallway at school, suddenly someone pulled my hand. Turns out it was Noah. He pulled me to the emergency exit and said, Sarah, stop being friends with Claire. She's not real. At first I was quite surprised, but then I cleared my throat <clears> throat> You are not telling me who I can be friends with. I'm not a kid. Then he took his phone out and showed me the pictures of me wearing Claire's clothes. Huh? Why did he have these pictures? I said, so what? She had my permission to take these photos. But not for posting them on the forum. Your pics hit a million likes. What if you become famous? They will find out you're just a daughter of... He hesitated. I was startled as he said that. He must have known my secret. Noah showed me Claire's post. She posted my pictures on the creative fashion forum to promote the outfit she designed with the message, Even ugly ducklings can turn into swans when wearing these. Oh my god. What did she mean by that? In a detailed description, she even added my story, telling that my family was poor but my firefighter father still chose to risk his life to save others? We are not poor, and that was my secret. How could she use that to get people's compassion? She turned out to be worse than the others. She used me and laughed at me behind my back. Seeing my worried face, Noah reassured me that his family's company had signed a contract with Claire, so the photos would be removed from the forum soon according to the company's regulations. He saved me again, and this time it was from my best friend here. My only friend. I trusted her and told her all of my secrets— but turns out I was just a joke to her. 
From that day on, I avoided Claire. I didn't bother to confront her because I knew she would just try to fake her way out of it. One day I was sitting in the cafeteria with Ashley and a group of friends. Claire came to our table and said she wanted to talk to me. I was annoyed and didn't want to talk to her, so I ignored her. Claire looked confused and grabbed my arm and said, Please, Sarah, I want to know what's going on. I shrugged her off and continued to ignore her. Seeing that, Ashley immediately stood up in a sarcastic tone, said, Sorry, there's no private talk in this group. Then she looked at Claire. Oh, wait, you don't belong here. That's when the other girls in the group laughed at Claire. She just stared at me, but I ignored her. I was still really mad at her. She ended up bursting into tears and running off. After Claire left, Ashley stood up and said, Even a girl like Claire dares to hurt Sarah. That's totally unacceptable. So this weekend, my parents are away, so I'm throwing the party of the year. It's dedicated to Sarah. My family totally owes her, and I want the whole school to know that. So make sure you're all there. Wow. She was having a party in my name. I just wanted a quiet life, but maybe I did need this, so others could at least leave me alone. After everyone finished lunch and left, Ashley pulled me aside and whispered, Hey, everyone's supposed to wear a costume. It's just a tradition of ours. You know, royal kids. She winked at me, then left. I was freaking out about what to wear, but turns out, I didn't need to worry. As soon after that, I received a parcel from Noah with the message, To shine at the party. Noah was so kind to be this thoughtful, but honestly, I didn't feel very comfortable when he treated me this way. Anyway, I opened the box and saw Wonder Woman's suit. This costume was so beautiful, and I loved it. That night, I put on the costume and did my hair and makeup. I felt so awesome in my outfit and couldn't wait to go to the party and see everyone else's outfits. However, when I followed the staffs and walked in, I saw that all the other girls were in trendy dresses. What? What was going on? Why was no one else dressed up? I stood there in panic when I heard someone say, Ew, our Wonder Woman has arrived. The other girls laughed frantically, and they gathered around me and pulled me out into the middle of the room. I looked around to find Ashley, but the more I tried to look, the more terrified I got. They were all staring and laughing at me. I blushed in embarrassment. This was so humiliating. I couldn't believe that I was being pranked again by everyone in the school. I was about to run out of that party when the loudspeakers sounded on stage. Hey, Sarah here. So I thought that the kids at my school were finally starting to accept me. Ashley had invited me to her party. Not only that, but she dedicated it to me. Then Noah sent me this awesome Wonder Woman costume to wear it. I showed up at the party feeling great, but then my mood soon changed when I realized I was the only one there in a costume. The crowd gathered around me so I couldn't run away. I felt so humiliated and lonely. I didn't belong here. I felt foolish for ever thinking that I did. I searched the crowd for at least one friendly face but couldn't find one. This was awful. I knew I needed to get out of this nightmare right now. I desperately searched for the nearest exit and was about to push my way through the crowd to get to it. But then the big monitor behind me let out a crash sound and I heard the crackling of flames. I looked back and saw that a shadow puppet show was playing on the monitor. I stared in shock at the familiar scene in front of me. There was a mansion on fire and then a firefighter burst into it and carried a young girl out. Then he collapsed in his comrade's arms. I watched as they showed another girl standing next to the fireman. She leaped up and down as money fell on her. I knew that the girl was meant to be me, and that Ashley was behind this. She was the only one who knew the story well enough, and the only one who could show the play here. The show went on, and I watched as a young man entered the frame with the young girl, and they kissed. Suddenly, the other girl came back on the screen and pulled the young man away from her. Then they ran off together. The ending scene was the young girl sitting alone and crying. The crowd booed and hissed at the screen. I stood there frozen. This was nonsense. I'd never stolen her boyfriend. Ashley must have misunderstood me and this was going too far. Well, actually not far enough for her. As to my horror, the show continued. 
actually appeared in front of the screen with her microphone. Suddenly, the spotlight was on me, and at the same time, Ashley said, Here she is, our real-life villain. Although it seems like she still thinks she's a hero. How could she do this to me? I trusted her and thought we were friends. All eyes were on me. They whispered, pointed, laughed, and threw dirty looks at me. I wiped my tears and tried to escape from the toxic crowd. That was when I bumped into Noah. Ashley might have misunderstood me, but how could Noah help her with that plan? What he did was far worse. I glared at him and said, Thanks for the costume. Are you satisfied now? He called my name and tried to say something, but all I cared about was getting out of there. It was the darkest day of my life, and I would never return to that school for monsters. No way. I explained to my mom what had happened, but I asked her to keep it a secret from Dad as I didn't want to upset him further, as he was still recovering from his injuries. So we told my dad that I was struggling with the work at the new school because I'd started so late. He supported me no matter what, but I know it kind of made him disappointed that I'd missed such a golden chance. I'm the daughter of the bravest firefighter. I will do my best to make him proud. I returned to my old school and realized how calm that world was in comparison to the rich kids' school. The only thing I did miss about that place was the plaster sculpture class. But it's okay. As I asked the art teacher for permission to start a plaster modeling club, she agreed, and I pinned the info on the notice board. No one seemed interested in it, but whatever. I was just happy that I could continue to make plaster models. The small club room was like a private domain, until one day Ben showed up. He walked in and asked, Is anyone here? At first this confused me, but then I noticed the tools in his hands and realized that he wanted to join the club. I smiled and said, Yes, me and Genevieve, welcome to our club. It turned out that Ben was a master at this, and he showed me loads of tips and tricks. Together, we nurtured our dreams of going to the same art college and being able to open an exhibition of our own. He was so sweet. He always bought us snacks to share, never got annoyed if I asked him to explain something multiple times, and he was a great listener. I really liked having Ben as a friend, but the one downside was being around him reminded me of Noah. I know he turned out to be a jerk, but I couldn't deny the fact that I'd liked him a lot. Then one time in club, things got awkward. Ben showed up with a bag of heart-shaped candy and started saying, Hey, Sarah, the thing is, I like... Uh Uh-oh, I knew where he was going. I liked Ben, but only as a friend. I couldn't let him confess his feelings for me, as that'd make everything awkward. So I interrupted him. Ben, I like you too. You're a great friend. Um, can you help me with this? Then I pointed at a section of my statue. Ben tried to say something, but I kept pretending to be busy with other matters. Then he just gave up and helped me in silence. After that, he didn't try to tell me how he felt again, and we carried on being friends as normal. It was best for everyone. High school ended, and all of our efforts led me and Ben to a top art college. I was so excited, but I was also afraid to open up and make friends with anyone again, as this hadn't worked out well for me before. Ben seemed to understand all of my feelings, so he was always with me. I was so grateful to have Ben there. He was an amazing friend and it was great being around someone who shared the same passion for art as I did. It was sweet that Ben cared for me, but at times he did take it a little far. Some of the other boys at college liked me, but they did not even have a chance to come close to me. I found out that Ben intercepted any gifts and cards they tried to send me and threw them in the trash. He even stopped them on the street when they tried to approach me on my way home, then demanded them to have a talk with him first. He took it so serious that I thought I was his little daughter. One time, when this guy told him that he'd meet me at all costs, Ben insisted on staying at my house so he could look out for me. I found the whole thing hilarious, and so did my dad. I guess how Ben acted looked odd to other people, too. Like, one time when we were having lunch, this guy stopped in front of our table and asked, Is he your boyfriend? If not, he has no right to act so clingy. To be honest, I didn't want to date anyone anyway. I didn't have time for boys. I wanted to focus on my art. So I grabbed Ben's hand and told the guy, Yes. He does have the right, so you better beware of him. I could see Ben blushing and smiling. He didn't still like me. Did he? The day of our final presentation arrived, and there were loads of talent agencies there to watch us. It could be considered as our very first interview. Recruiters were allowed to question us to make their employment decisions. It was so scary, but also exciting. 
Afterward, my lecturer told me that both I and Ben had received some great offers, including a company that wanted to hire the both of us. I immediately texted Ben to meet me on the college rooftop to celebrate. But when I saw him, I noticed that he looked sad. Okay, this made no sense. He should have been as excited as I was. I asked him, What's wrong, Ben? We can still work together. I will confirm the deal, and I can't wait to work with you. But Ben sadly said, Congrats, Sarah, but I'm so sad that I can't stay. You know I always want to be with you, but I have my own dream to reach. His dream? I had never thought to ask about his dream before. I had just presumed it was the same as mine. Now I felt bad that I'd been so selfish toward him. Ben continued, I got an offer from a museum in San Francisco. They said I could develop my idea for my project there. That's my dream, organizing my own art exhibitions, and I don't want to miss it. Could you come with me, Sarah? The offer he'd received was amazing. They must have been extremely impressed with him. But as excited as I was for him, I wasn't sure about going with him. There was no company in San Fran that wanted me, but I had opportunities here. Ben could see through my feelings. He suddenly took my hands and said, I love you, Sarah. You know that. Please give me a chance. I don't want us to be apart. I pulled my hands back. I can't, Ben. This is your dream, and you should go for it, but it isn't mine. I know you'll be successful, and you can come back one day and find me. I trailed off. Seeing my resolute attitude, Ben didn't say anything more, but just looked away. That afternoon, I realized we had to grow up from young dreamers and become warriors of our future. After all, the future looked bright, and I was excited to see where mine would take me.